Yes, what a guest we've got on the day. I've been desperate to get him on. The mad high beat, Franco Begbie, one of me, Gordon Smart. Thanks <laughs> for coming funny. on, mate. Thanks for having me. What a legend, man. Thanks for coming. Thanks for coming to visit me in the hills as well. I appreciate it, man. What a gaff. Aye, well, it's been uh, a long time coming, grafting away to make this happen. You know, we bought it and it was a ruin. And it's uh, that's my secret pleasure. I mean, the missus love doing doing all that stuff. Doing, doing stuff nice up. up. Aye. Aye. Question everyone wants to know, though, is where does big Jim Leishman drop his play piece? <laughs> well, you know what? He's actually he brought me a bottle of whiskey. And he says, there's a proper bottle, son, and it's called The Legend. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's called it's Glen Turret Whiskey, right? right? And my pal, who's like this whiskey expert, came round when Big Leishman was here. And I said, go and give us, like, how good is this stuff, this legend drink? And he looked at it, t- turned it around, read the bottle, and he was like, that is utter piss. Have you told Jim was like, oh, shit. <laughs> Brilliant. Uh, got you on here as well as the second ba- best band that we've ever had on. Thank you very much. Who's, who's number one? Wilford. <laughs> <laughs> she keep asking her. I like it. Well, Lego, I used to play football with a boy in London and he called me Lego Head. <laughs> oh, you're looking at 39, you said you were? I'm 39, I'm 40 next year. Looking tremendous, mate. Thank when are you talking about your whiskey yes. as well? It's a gift for me. That's a gift for you. As you can see, I've written it with Crayon on there, Cy Ferry. So you can rub it out and give it to somebody else if you want. Brilliant, but, man. Aye, that's what I've been Smash busy with the last night. few years. When I left Papers, that was one of the reasons I was working on this whiskey with a few friends of mine in London. And it's going really well, you know. So I'm off to. New York soon and then Australia as well to, to sell that to the aye, to the Americans and Aussies. Right, on to you, mate. As you say, aye. big high uh, Massive Hibs fan, aye. Earliest memory of following Hibs. Well, I've got a really weird one here for you, actually, because uh, my dad took me and my brother to see Hibs v Aberdeen in the 80s. And I was asking my brother about this. He doesn't remember it, but we got turned away because it was too dangerous. Because the Hibs casuals were like, wild, weren't they? Aberdeen at the, the time, in the 80s. The same, uh-huh. like, not a good time to go and see Hibs. Yeah. So that was my, probably my earliest memory, although he doesn't even remember it. But uh, we went to see Hibs v Dundee. I was 12. He's two and a half years older than me, my big brother Graham. And he said, right, I'm going to start taking you to the Hibs games. And that was 1992, I think it was. And we got pumped at home by Dundee. And uh, there were less than 5,000 people at Easter Road. So it was sad times, And I remember it? thinking... Is this what it's going to be like being a Hibs fan? And it's shite being Scottish. It's shite being Scottish. <laughs> and in all fairness, it, was, it wasn't a great time supporting Hibs like in the 90s, really. When it, there were some great moments and all the rest of it. But yeah. that, that's my earliest memory. It's a weird one, right? Because people say, why are you a Hibs fan? But we were born at uh, Simpsons in Edinburgh, right? My mum and dad lived in Toll Cross. Right. And uh, we, my dad was a medical student. He's a doctor, right? So then he moved out to... We moved out to Lonithgow and he was working in a hospital at the Bangor. And... Uh, Aye, so we were living in Lenithgow for four years and then we moved to Kinross, right? So when I was four, we moved to Kinross and everyone supported Aberdeen then. There was loads of glory hunters where I live. Right, OK. Like, Aberdeen fans because they were doing well. Uh, there's quite a lot of Dunfermline fans and St Johnston fans, but we were like, we're from Edinburgh. So we decided to follow Hibs. Did you have tear-ups with the other fans about Kinross now? It doesn't happen in Kinross, does it? What's weird, Kinross is a lovely place, eh? Yeah. <laughs> but it's got a bit of a dark edge. Has it? And also what you don't realise is that it's right in the middle of the travel and support, right? So if you're getting the bus from Edinburgh North to play Dundee or Aberdeen, Kinross is on the way. So there'd always be quite interesting gatherings. Right, you know uh, what I mean? Oh, that's where they would... So I followed Hibs loads in the 90s with my brother and uh, travelling was dangerous as a Did Hibs you fan. see the casuals like that? Oh, all the time, aye. We were always... Did bump... you join in there? Uh, well, can't talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> my, my fight record's dreadful, so like, I've been about 20 fights, lost all 20. <laughs> have you ever fought big, have you ever 50 50 big leashman? Uh, you know what? I was thinking about that the other day. I've seen him play football in the garden a few times and he's he still thinks he's got it. Like, Are you better than that? Me, Jimmy plays as well. We need to mention me, Jimmy. 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 Is we Jimmy, Jimmy decent? He's... He's, he's not, you know what? He's going to be big. Good. And he's, he's, he's not bad. He's not bad. I didn't want to put any pressure on him. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. I want him to enjoy it for himself, but he's obsessed with football. Ah, I've just met him there. He's, he's a statue. He's, he knows he's everything, doesn't he? He's right into it. Yeah, he loves the match attacks and uh, he's mad into FIFA. And he's obsessed with John McGinn, Lewis Stevenson. It's weird, actually. He's, uh, the John McGinn thing's been great for him because he's had this superstar in his team. Yeah. And the lucky wee shite, right? His earliest football memory will be seeing Hibs win the Scottish Cup. <laughs> and some of the shit you had to watch. Tell me, wee bastard. I saw all 23 of the games when we couldn't beat Hearts. I went to every Did single you? one. Every single one of the 23 in a row. Unbelievable. No wonder you've That's got that a drink there. <laughs> so, uh, right, I'm a Hibs, so I'm a Hibs fan. And heroes? Was, what about heroes? Uh, right, well, early on, I mean, I loved... Uh, Gordon Hunter actually was the centre half because he, right. he was called Gordon as well. When you're wee, you kind of attach yourself yeah. to that. But you think about the players we had back then. Like even like, I remember Andy Gorham having a fight on the pitch. 
mind that? Andy, no, no, no. Andy Gorham was a goalie and he, he panelled somebody on the pitch. That stuck with me for some reason. And then Hibs won the uh, tenant soccer sixes, which you'll be too young to remember. Yeah, I didn't remember that either, no. Which was a, it was a massive thing when we were kids, the tenant soccer sixes. Uh, somebody spoke about it here. The, the boys uh, having like fags on the side, didn't <laughs> <Probably, like, laughs> it? Was, the Hibs team was brilliant. It was a John Collins, Paul Kane, Gordon Hunter. It was a brilliant team. And uh, Mickey Weir as well. I loved Mickey Weir. Yeah, what a player. Keith Wright. Uh, that generation were absolutely brilliant Hibs players because they just won the Skull Cup. And I think John Collins moved on then, but there were some some cracking players early on. Is then. Paul Kane the mad Raj bastard that always he's like a spokesperson for the fans? Aye, K K <laughs> are you pals with him? Kano should get an MBE man. Honestly, he's one of the greatest people I've ever met. Is I love he? him. I love him. Kano is he's absolute class man. And what people didn't realise because he's a bit of a Raj is that he didn't have a drink till he was thirty two, and now he owns pubs in Edinburgh. Uh -huh. He even owns the vending machines at Edinburgh Airport. Does he? He's got, honestly, he's Del Proper like, entrepreneur, huh? Aye, but I love him. He's, he, see, when I was at the paper and I was doing the showbiz stuff, right? Kano used to ring me up and say, right, Gogs, I've got an idea for you. What we're going to do, right? You're going to get famous people and what we're going to do is we're going to get on the roof of Edinburgh Castle and we're going to hit golf balls into buckets from the roof. And I'm like, why is that, Kano? He said, well, what we'll do is we'll charge folk to watch, eh? And you and me will go half some of the money and, uh, <laughs> and he had this little cash fees, he'd go, dink, dink, dink. So he's like, right, Gogs, we'll do this, dink, dink, dink. I was like, Kano, what's in this for me? <laughs> you know? it's I love him when he comes on the telly. I love yeah. him. But he came down to stay with me once in, uh, in London and I took him to a Kasabian gig and after about 30 seconds, he's like, this is shite. <laughs> Get the proclaimers on. Straight into the pub. <laughs> so I missed the whole gig, got banjoed with Kano, he lost his phone in a taxi. <laughs> right, but the worst part of it, right? So he was staying in the Tower Thistle in London, right? And um, he didn't have his phone, and obviously everybody thought he was dead. So what he did was uh, he reversed the charges and put the bill through to me. So about two weeks later, I got this bill for about 400 quid for Kano's room. <laughs> I was like, Kano, what's the score here? He went, you get some free tickets, eh, son? It's <laughs> deal. Oh, what a man. I love him. Uh, what about yourself? Did you play? I did, aye, aye. Any so, good? Uh, <laughs> Never good enough, right? Yeah. I would love to have been a footballer. That would have been my dream. I played for Kinross, right? And I, I don't think it helps you growing up in a place like Kinross because it's too nice. Yeah. So we'd end up playing the boys with Dundee and we'd get leathered off you, you know? Even going to Perth playing, I remember playing against a guy called Kevin Duncan who was signed on S forms at Dundee, Dundee United. And uh, I remember the police turning up to arrest them. <laughs> they ran <laughs> off the pitch in North Newton. Um, but I remember I, when I was, I was quite good when I was like 11, 12, 13 because I was strong enough right? and I remember uh, I won Players Player of the Year and uh, there was a write up in the Persian Advertiser and we got beaten 9-1 by uh, like a St Johnston youth I think it was who would it have been I would have been and Sergi Baltaccia played for them so these names might mean nothing no to I you, know Baltaccia that was his daughter that was a tennis player Elena uh, Baltaccia yeah, yeah. sad story that but uh, his mum his dad was a uh, manager at St Johnston at the time and he was brilliant I remember like man Did he right, feel back Baltaccia no he was a striker, striker was he, right? so he said that Gordon Smart was prolific in defence now as a journalist that's not right you don't well, want to be prolific in defence but he pumped he scored all nine wait so he says you were prolific in defence he conceded nine it should have been 25 <laughs> he was honestly he was amazing in like Arsenal Man United Real Madrid people were coming to watch him at that time Baltaccia right. when he was 12-13 so played for Kinnos Colts got to like 15 and I was, I was actually a swimmer that was my thing right. and then you reach puberty and then you're like oh no like everyone's can't get tongues to fit <laughs> exactly. no it was the other way around I, like, I look like you even now eh? when I was about 14 and uh, aye so football 15-16 was quite tough because eh? everybody stretched I remember playing in the Scottish schools trials right. and thinking right we, I'm, I'm just not good enough uh -huh. Take but, so there were some cracking players around them I think Charlie Miller was the same for age oh, as me what a player and uh, I remember Kenny Miller, actually, Charlie would have been a bit older, Kenny Miller, I remember him playing, and, and we never got through the trials, but we got invited to a game at Broadwood, right? So it was the Scotland team, our year, and they played England, and it was the day they launched the Predator Boots. Right. So John Collins came on with your man, Craig Johnson, wasn't it, who invented the Predator Boots, right. he was at Liverpool. And they did this demonstration about whipping the ball and curling it into the top corner, and we were all sitting in the huff in the stand, like we didn't get picked, and we were, Scotland got pumped about seven 0 by England. Like and I think Michael Owen played that day. Ran Danny up. Jeffers. Wow. And, uh, yeah, and that was my year. I tremendous. So, uh, not good enough. Right, your work. How did you find yourself getting in, uh, in the old media? It's a great story. I think this is a quite an interesting story. Go for it. So I set up a school newspaper with a group of folk when I was about 15, 16, and we made it a tabloid newspaper. And the first front page we ever had was, "Did you know your art teacher was in Wet Wet Wet?" So we found out, Mister Cowie. Right. Kinross High School was in the original lineup of Wet Wet Wet. Wow. So that was a, and I thought, this is good fun, this. But at the time, I thought I would be a doctor or, you know, I'd follow my dad's footsteps or whatever. Because I always stuck in at was school. Was your dad a doctor, eh? Aye, aye. So I always stuck in at school. And um, 
it, I realised this is good fun. And then uh, the teachers started to get the hump because we did a thing called Teacher Watch. <laughs> Have you seen your teacher in the local pub? And looking back at it, it's probably the first signs of being a tabloid scumbag. Like, yeah. And um, it was like we were bumping into teachers in nightclubs and stuff and uh, writing about it. And um, I think the head teacher at the time was, like, gave me a, took me aside and said, you're going to have to stop doing this. So I made this big thing about censorship and freedom of the press. And did all you? That. What did you? 17, 18 by that wow. point, aye. And it was called the Teacher People Express. And somebody where I lived must have worked at the Courier and told them about it. And this guy called Ron Ross at the Courier and the Telegraph got in touch and said, have you ever thought about being a journalist? And I was like, nah. And he said, you should think about it. So I left school on the Friday when I was 18 and started at the Courier on the Monday, full time as a trainee reporter on a salary. And I got uh, two pound every day for my lunch. Wow. I've still got the typewritten letter from DC Thompson saying, we're offering you the job as a junior reporter. And I think I did about four, four or five months there. So I, I, with I finished school in the May and worked all the way through to university. And it was amazing. I like, got my first front page in about two weeks, met a boy in the chippy who's telling me that these kids were climbing the pylons in Arbler. Right. And uh, it was the first front page, Dyson with death. But you didn't get your name on the stories at the Tilly at the time. At the end of my time at DC Thompson's, they said, right, here's your full-time job, son. This is the package you're going to be on. And we reckon in, you know, 20 years' time, you might be the editor. And I looked across and the editor was sitting with his cardigan on smoking a pipe. I was like, fuck oh, that. <laughs> and uh, I, worked with all these, I worked with these great guys eh, that had just come out of university and it was all their first jobs. There was a boy called Derek Brown, who's like a really important person in my life, Derek. And Derek's like, get the get the fuck out of here. Go, university would be the best crack you've ever had. So I went to university and then mad shit happened to me when I was at university that kind of changed my path forever. And what was that? What was so, the mad shit? So I got this... Drugs? De- uh, no. no but that, that. I mean, that, that's a mad story in it's early because that's the thing with Ken Ross. Like, I kind of ran away a wee bit because there was so much trouble here, you know? Yeah. A lot of my friends did get sucked into bad stuff, you know? Right. So I went to university. That's another... That's for another day, though. Right, okay. Uh, so I went to university and um, in my first week met this guy uh, who was promoting nightclubs. And same thing, started speaking to a stranger. I ended up running this club Nightclub. night called Shark, which was the biggest in Britain. Wow. Was, so we had two and a half thousand students on a Wednesday night at the Cavendish in Edinburgh. And then we got headhunted. We moved it to a place called what used to be Century 2000, which was then Revolution. And again, two and a half thousand students every Wednesday. And then folk in Glasgow said, look, this club you do, do you want to bring it to Glasgow? So we took it to Glasgow and we did that in a place called Destiny. Which Destiny, is, I remember Destiny. Destiny. So I used to like... Couple of get-offs in there, I got <laughs> I bet, I, I remember you being barred. <laughs> Didn't we? Well, the pipes was behind the bar when he's not allowed in. <laughs> Fake ID. Me and um, Big Richard Goff. I, oh, see, that was a funny thing, right? Because it was a student night, all the footballers would come because it must have been fitting nicely so they didn't drink two days before the game. Yeah, right. So would with. you get pally with them? So Barry Ferguson used to come. Scott Nicholson, mind him. Right, uh-huh. uh Big Scott Wilson, who was the massive, half, massive uh-huh. heavy. He's a copper now in Govan. Is he? He was trouble, like, I loved him, right, but he was always in the wind-up, eh? What, right? Like, Scott, they end up, he was at Dunfermline. When I Kate's remember him at Dunfermline, huh? Good player, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Rangers, didn't I, I played for I Rangers, right, I played in Europe for Rangers. So all the, all the footballers in Glasgow used to come, and uh, I remember uh, uh, Higgins as well, John Higgins coming and having nights out. We've done stuff. John Higgins as well. Ah, yeah, yeah, he's yeah, a character. Like out, I remember yeah. him being banjo in the club and all that, but it was great, so I was, like, in charge of this mad like mad student life for years and in Edinburgh man like the crack we used to have and it's weird now because I, I bump when I was in newspapers I started to bump into the boys that used to come when they were in youth team right yeah. so Tam McManus Kenny Miller <laughs> Ian Murray uh, I mean that Hibs that was my brilliant that was my, my happiest days with Hibs right it yeah. was 98 97 to 2001 so I was running the club 98 2001 and I used to do all the VIP passes with this VIP bar and I get all the Hibs lads in, and it was great, like Ian Murray and Tam McManus. So like, would you say get a beer room in that? Ah, I used to get banjoed with them, eh? Oh, and used to, in exchange for free passes for them and the girls they were seeing, they'd get me tickets for Hibs. And uh, I got really pally with a guy called Liam O'Sullivan, and it's such a sad story. Like Liam died, eh? He was like five, he was in a five-year deal at Hibs, and Jerome Fry broke his leg, and I think he went off the rails a wee bit. But I've never really spoken about it, but like it, it really got to me, it really upset me, eh? Like. I'm still sad about it now, but all those boys were great. Kenny Miller, Tam McManus, that that crowd that came through at Hibs, I loved them. You know, some of the stuff you must have seen. Obviously, but, you can't speak. No, I can tell you. I can tell you some of the stories. Right, go there. Like, I can remember getting arrested with Dirk Lehman. No way. <laughs> I because like Dirk, <laughs> <laughs> he was wearing. A, I remember he was wearing a leather trench coat. Dirty Dirk the porn star. He was, going, <laughs> he was the worst. He was in the club every night. Was he right? And uh, 
I don't know what he'd done, but he'd walked past me at the club looking shifty, and the next thing I could see three police cars chasing. And he's like, come with me, in this German accent. And I'm like, why? So we ended up, like, jumping fences, like, running away from the police. And uh, anyway, he was faster than I was because he's a professional footballer. Uh, and did you get lifted? And we got lifted, and he was like, why are you running? And I was like, well, he plays for Hibs, and I see quite a lot of them, and he just said, come with me. <laughs> And he said, who was it? And he said, you said he played for Hibs. And I was like, oh, no, I think he was lying. <laughs> and he was like, I don't know what he'd done, but anyway, he was on the run. And, uh, oh, God, we had some great scrapes there, like Matty Jack, the other German boy. Matthias Jack, Matthias yeah, Jack. Yeah, yeah. Remember, but we had, like, a tray of vodka red bulls, like, me and him and, like, Tam McManus would have been there. Tam will be shiting it, thinking that I'm talking about this stuff. And uh, we'll, oh, he'll love it, mate. He loves it, didn't We you were know? steaming, like, reeking. And the next day, I went on work experience with a Herald. <laughs> Uh, to Easter Road to interview Matty Jack and he was stinking of booze like, <laughs> and I was like I was some night la last night Matty and he was like I've never met you and I was like fuck off you never met me <laughs> I've got a bar tab here for about 400 quid you never fucking met me and there was a guy, was a guy called Rob Robertson from uh, the Herald the right. aye, aye. and I, it was stuff like that used to happen all the time brilliant and eh? I, was, I loved it like Russell Latape I've never told this oh I've, he loves a fag as well I've never it, told this story right, before right? so Scotland the Scottish Cup 2000 it was 2000 2001 aye uh, Russell Latape got dropped for the cup final our best player because he got caught on a night out in the pish at our club and uh, Dwight so York it was your had, fault? well I, I wouldn't say it was my fault but I was involved would you ever have went no I'm not no serving you because you've got a game now. No, nah, definitely not. No, nah. <laughs> he's probably better. Steve, all those players were at it all the time. I mean, Dwight, Dwight York had come up from Man United, and uh, or was he at Villa? Can't mind. But we had this mad night out, and uh, a picture ended up in the news of the world. A Russell in the back of a a lad we knew's Volkswagen Beetle. It was Dwight York, Russell, and about seven girls in the back. <laughs> and he got dropped. He got dropped. And I remember sitting at that cup final, thinking, "Oh man, this, this is what." I'm Disaster! What a player! So Hibs fan sure could he... probably blame you for losing that final. Huh? No, <laughs> no, no! <laughs> I'm pretty sure he got dropped, but it was a massive thing from McLeish. I'd have to have to check if he definitely got dropped, but he was definitely in the shite. Anyway, to be fair, though, seven birds in a cup final. <laughs> seven birds, didn't you? Fuck! It was a cup final every night for him in Edinburgh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, right. So when did you start? When did you leave the nightclubs and start interviewing the big names? So I, I fell in love with Kate Leishman, Jim Leishman's daughter, eh? right? And then how did you meet her? Scott? We went to school together. Right. We went to school. So we went out of school, and then Kate went to musical theatre school in London. So we had this kind of awkward. I went to the Courier. She went to Dundee. I was never going to work, was it? No. Nah. So we made an agreement, right, you go and do your thing, I'll do my thing, and we'll see what happens in the future. So Kay was in London, and uh, I started going down to London. I bumped into her on a night out in Dunfermline, all the glamour -y. And it's a, it's a weird story as well, actually, because um, I broke my leg really, really badly, and uh, 20 years ago, almost to the day, playing for the university uh -huh. against Strathclyde Uni. One of the fastest sendings off in Scottish football history. The, the three, guy sent off three, for you, sir? Three sec he, he got sent three seconds. Nice. So I was playing centre midfield, the ball got passed back to me, their striker came through two feet outside of my leg and everyone was like, oh! It was the morning after Larson. Why is that after Because we're in the dressing room everyone was like, did you see Larson's leg last night? Well, I was minging, wasn't it? So I was, it was on, obviously on my mind, it was weird. And everyone was like, it came, one boy came and pinned me down and said, Denny Luke, whatever you do, Denny Luke, oh Denny Luke. Oh my God. And the first thing when somebody says Denny Luke, I looked up and I could see the sole of my boot. I, saw, I could see the sole of my own foot. I just bought those Predators. Like, oh, yeah. fucking, I was like, oh, oh no. And then hospital, like, I was fucked. Didn't kick a ball for 18 months. Like, eight screws, metal plate, disaster. But it was mental, because I was meant to go and see Kate in London, and I didn't. And she she, she didn't find... You didn't have mobile phones, right? right? So she was like, cheeky fucker, I was meant to come and see me, didn't he? Fuck him. And she ended up going out with another laddie, and that was it. So that kept us apart for three years. Then I bumped into her on a night out in Dunfermline, and uh, that was that. I ended up back... <laughs> Fuck, we're going to tell a story. Go on, Brett, go on. Fucking hell. I ended up back at Leishman's house, eh? Right? <laughs> oh, no. And he, his, he wouldn't watch this. In his room? No. <laughs> that was another time. No. <laughs> oh, fucking hell. And uh, we ended up back at his house, right? And I hadn't seen him for three years, right? Because I'd been a bit away to do my thing. Kate was in London. And uh, it was a bit awkward. It was in the morning. It was Kate's mum's birthday, right? And everyone turns up at the house and we've obviously woken up and thought, oh, fuck, how are we going to square this one off? But the worst thing is, like, it'd been a wild night out with my football lads at the time. And uh, in the middle of the night, I'd gone to Leishman's toilet <clears throat> and had a, had a bad time. And there was no bog roll in the toilet, <laughs> no towels, nothing. And I was like, oh. This is like spud on teams. What am I going to fucking do? So I had my shirt on and I thought, oh. so I ripped the pocket off my shirt 
did a, what I think was a pretty special job, feeling quite proud of myself, tidied <laughs> things up, went back to bed. Anyway, the next day, like all the family, all Kate's family, everybody's there for a barbecue. And Kate's dad, obviously, I said, hello, and see you for a while. And he's like, giving me the fucking football manager thing. I'm shiting it, sorry, like, <laughs> I'm shiting myself. <laughs> and he closed the kitchen door. There's two doors in his kitchen, closed one door, got me in, closed the other door. I'm standing there. And he just kind of gently manoeuvred me up against it. And he said, I like you, son, but a wee bit of fucking respect, right? It's my daughter. If this is going to be a regular thing, great. But remember, it's my house. She's got a wee brother. You respect my house. Do you understand, son? I'm like, yes, Jim, I, no problem. I, I wouldn't, you, know, you understand, it's just, uh, we didn't take the piss, eh? And he went, by the way, what happened to your shirt? And I'm like, oh, I was mucking about the lads last night, eh? And I, one of them ripped it off. And he went, funny that, because when I woke up this morning, it was in the pocket of our shirt was in the toilet. <laughs> And then he just like slapped me in the face and fucked off. Oh, and then we up, anyway, we got married and been married nearly what seventeen years, been together twenty years. So did you did you move to London or so after I, that? So I chased Kate to London. Yeah. Right? By the way, Kate's career at that time, like she was flying, like she was in. What the, was it she was then? She was musical theatre, so right. singing and dancing in the West End, doing pop oh, videos. Brilliant, eh? So I thought, fucking brilliant, I'll go carry her bags around London. Brilliant, she's going to do great. And so I moved down to London. Couldn't get a job in newspapers. Graduated from university. Couldn't get. I honestly couldn't get a job. I was fucked. You said you were skinny as well. Didn't I mean, you? I was. I was on signing on. I was wow. signing on at least. So how did it turn? Then? Well, it was a mad one as well. <laughs> oh man, it's what such a. Life, a it's, it's a what weird a story. Life. It's a weird story. Like so, I'm skin. Kate's in London, and by the way, it's fucking hard to live in London. Like it's, yeah. it's, everything's expensive. Everything's expensive, and it was. I was miserable, and I was like, fucking hell, what am I going to do? So I was at the gym one day, like at the. There was a free gym near where we lived, and we were in Surrey at the time, Epsom, Surrey, because her college was there. And I went to the gym, there was a poster up on the wall saying, football coaches, curve or coaching. So I rang the number and went and met the guy for a, a drink, and I got a job as a football coach. Didn't know the curve, did you? Did, is that all the skills in Aye, it? so it was, it was brilliant. I loved it, man. Right. So he trained me up as a coach, and then the guy realised that I had a degree and was, was in the daft, so I ended up running the office for him, and then ended up running the, all the classes around Surrey for him. And uh, I was coaching, and it was brilliant. Like, I used to coach these, like, I'd do a lot of posh kids in, in Surrey, and then I'd go and do the Young Offenders in Kingston. Oh, and wow. And it was great. And then um, they used to have an elite class as well, and Jack Wilshire was in, that shows how, how old I am, eh? Was he? He, was, he would have been seven or eight. And what, could you remember seeing him and thinking, what a player? Fuck it, I mean, all the boys in the elite classes were all signed in uh, pro clubs in at that age. At so eight, you're coaching seven, good eight. talent, huh? And I, I, you know what, I loved it as well. I was, I was really happy because, like, you know, I was working with all ex footballers, right? And, I mean, I always loved football, but I was a decent, decent enough level, a good amateur player, never good enough to play professionally. Mm -hmm. But I got, I got really good because I was training every day. I'm and playing like Chick Ch fucking Chandler. I, right? I was like fucking Chick Chandler <laughs> and Ray Wilkins, and um, it was great. And um, then I started like, I worked for a guy called Gwen Berry who ran Curver Coaching, and he he won the FA Trophy. We walk in, I mean, he was, Charlie Cook was our boss, right. Charlie uh -huh. Scotland uh -huh. legend, Dundee Dundee like, legend, wow. and um, <clears> they're like, do you want to go to America and coach? And I was like, I don't know, this isn't for I'm. I've got other, I'm better at other stuff. And it, it was a real decision. It was a real decision about going away to America, being a football coach or what I was going to do. At the time, I'd had a trial for Sutton United and I was thinking, right, I'm going to go and play at that level. I thought I could do it at that decent level. Decent level. I was Sutton, decent uh, level, uh, uh. right. So it was Sutton, Sutton United, Kingstonian, and all that lot. And I, was, I played an amateur game, broke my leg. Fuck it, I was absolutely gutted. Yeah. Like, broke my leg, like, really badly. Same one, boy stamped me, took the bottom off my ankle. And it was like, same one, the metal one. That was me out for another year, and I was ended up because I couldn't coach. I was sitting like a Janny at the football with a degree, I had like five, I had seven hires and fucking eight standing yeah. grades at grade one. You know, I was like, what the fuck am I doing? I've been signing on, I'm miserable. Me and Kate were skint, like she was struggling to get jobs. And uh, a mate of mine gave me a job at an agency in Edinburgh called Deadline Scotland. So he worked for all the papers. So I'd worked for the you know, I'd work for the uh, Scotsman one day, I'd do a shift for the mail the next day, I'd do something for the Scotsman. And I did a year of that, it was the hardest year of my life because Kate stayed in London and I went back to Scotland, we were engaged. Right. And it was fucking brutal. It was horrible. Like, I mean, it, it, it taught me to really grow up, but that was the hardest year of my life because you're getting sent to knocking doors and ask for pictures of kids that had died in accidents and oh. stuff. And I was thinking, fuck, is this what being a grown-up is? Uh... But what happened then, right, and this is the like one of those moments in your life that changes everything. MTV Europe came to Edinburgh, right, 2002. And uh, the boy Derek Brown I mentioned, who worked at the Courier, yeah. he worked for The Sun. 
So all the journalists from London came up for MTV Europe, everybody from every paper. And it was Kylie Minogue and Justin Timberlake and all the rest of it. But because I knew everyone in Edinburgh, I got them all in all the clubs, right? So Timberlake and Kylie, something might have happened there, it ended up in the paper. And I'd put them in the right place for it to happen. So they said, what the fuck are you doing working in Scotland? Come and, come and work in Fleet Street. So I went from £12,000 a year working at this agency, fucking miserable. You know, I, I sold my flat in Leith at this point. I was back living with my mum and dad. It was that bad. Right. And uh, they said, right, we'll offer you X amount of money, which was multiples of what I was earning. And I was 22, working at the big... At this point, the biggest newspaper in the world, right? Yeah. The sun was massive, uh-huh. before social media. Yeah. And I didn't really... And I realised people didn't like the paper. But at the same time, five million people were reading it on a Saturday. Mm. So well, not everybody hated it, right? Yeah, yeah. And I was working for the biggest showbiz column at the time. So the internet didn't really have a presence in terms of news for showbiz and stuff. So it was the biggest showbiz column in the world. And I was a showbiz reporter on it at 22 years old. I had unlimited expenses, getting paid loads of money. And I went from not being able to afford, you know, a fucking McDonald's to being able to go to the Ivy and have the time of my life. And, wow. and That's all just through personality, isn't it? Mate, it's been Scottish. It's just been Scottish. So, huh? It's like the biggest advantage I've had in my life. And I thought, right, I got a great bit of advice from somebody who said, work harder than everyone else, do the shifts nobody else will do, and you'll do really well in newspapers. And I fucking panelled it from like 2002 to 2006. I did. I worked every day, 12, 13, 14 hours, did every job. And uh, I, by the time I was 25, I was the deputy editor. Then I was the editor at 26 in the showbiz column. Wow. And it was it was brilliant. You know, I had the time of my life. Like I, I still can't believe it's over, like, I mean, I'd you know, be in Los Angeles one week, then I'd be off in Europe travelling with a band or, you know, at the Grammys, the Oscars, the BAFTAs, the Brits. It was amazing, man. I had the most incredible 10 years of my life. And uh, I did quite a lot of damage, though. <laughs> like, serious damage. Wow. And uh, I, I'm just glad that I got through it, you know, because after that, it all gets dead serious. I, it's mm-hmm. like, it's that, I'd imagine it's like being a footballer when you, your career ends and then you go into management. Are you and, going to this? Aye, well... I'm so chuffed with what you're doing. You're going to love it, right? Think, uh-huh. And right until the wheels come off. It's See, I, well, I'm doing that same mm. advice. Did the shifts that people didn't want to do. That's Aye. why I ended up interviewing Gary O'Connor and Derek. <laughs> <laughs> I used to see them down the door office. Right? I, love, well, I love those guys. Oh, two of the best love guys them. ever. And what, what about some of the big names? And you mentioned there that you, who Aye. was it? Like, was there a, a moment? The first moment that you thought, "Oh my God, I've fucking made it here, man." Ah, well, there was yeah, there were quite a few like early on. Like I remember. Uh, like befriending Noel Gallagher. That was really How did that on. come about? Um, well, his missus is Scottish. Yeah, uh, Sarah, is it? Aye, uh, Sarah, yeah. And, and like Sarah, Sarah... I think I've got a for as well before. Uh, well, back in the day. you'd have been about seven. <laughs> 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 you'd started young. But uh, yeah, Sarah and I just had a bit of crack and she knew a boy I worked with and we got on great. And then we were out one night and I met Noel for the first time and I was banjoed, like absolutely battered. And we what just, stories we, do? We, can, we, that's yeah. a common theme, isn't it? <laughs> we're having such a good crack and Noel's like... Who the fuck are you, you pest? <laughs> and I was like, fuck you, eyebrows. <laughs> like, and we ended up just having this great crack, and he's like, come on, we're going for a night out. And we got on really well. And then the funny part of the story is quite embarrassing. Oh, fuck, I might as well tell you. It's what this is all about. Go for it. So we went to see Franz Ferdinand, right? And uh, I got the call up from Noel's, like, texting me and said, right, come on, we're going to see Franz Ferdinand. <clears throat> so we'd gone out for a few drinks and then he went for dinner with his missus and he's like, there's an after party, do you want to meet up for that? I was like, yeah, brilliant. And I had like hours to kill and I was steaming and I ended up buying some bongo DVDs from a shop in Soho, steaming. No <laughs> and I had this black bin liner with two porno DVDs. <laughs> and, Can't uh, get a shot at them. <laughs> and I turned up at this after party, steaming with these, this dodgy black bag and Noel was like what's in your bag I'm like oh fuck I didn't think he'd ask I was like oh no and he went what's in your fucking and he grabbed the bag and emptied it and these two pornos and he was like that is fucking brilliant <laughs> <laughs> you, you're in for life <laughs> and then that's how you became like, pals and he, he fucking nicked one as well it was about 40 quid <laughs> about 40 quid to come. and then after that like, we had a few like massive like massive nights out that, um, I remember one really early on I went out um, on a piss with his missus and my Kate was there as well and we ended up on an all-nighter, like a proper... Ended up in some weird underground illegal bar in London called Jerry's, right? And uh, Tim Healy from Avida Zane Pet was there. And it's weird, like, all, uh, like, mad things, seven o'clock in the morning. It's an orgy, let's be honest. Yeah, it was an orgy, yeah. <laughs> and I, I, you know, obviously smelt the handkerchief and woke up. But no. <laughs> so I, we're steaming again, and I forgot I was interviewing Rod Stewart, right? And it was, like, one of my first really big interviews. I was 24 at the time, 20, yeah, 24. 
and I've turned up and realised that I'm not fit to do an interview, right. but this is the paper and I need to get my shit together, right? So it was like half past eight at the Langan Hotel in London, this beautiful hotel, and Rod's got a suite and they had this brilliant publicist called Moira and she's like, right, Gordon, are you okay? And I was like, I'm, I'm fine, I'm all right, I'm all right. She went like, go, go up to his suite, just settle yourself down for a wee bit, get yourself straight, have a drink of water, son. And Rod, he's having his breakfast, he'll be up in 15 minutes. And I've got up into the room on my own, I'm in Rod Stewart's suite, like still in the same clothes from the night out, haven't been to bed, I'm absolutely burst. And I'm like, I'm gonna be sick. I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be fucking sick. And I've gone into his, I've gone into Rod Stewart's bog and he's got all these stuff, like he's, I remember I had his initials and everything. I've gone in and I've puked and it's one of them that's gone what fucking hero. everywhere, right? And I'm like, oh no. So I've got my jack off, I'm sweating, I'm like cleaning up this puke. It's it's like rank puke as well, like Guinness. Sweet and corn. Martinis and fucking, oh, it's horrific. And I'm cleaning it up and I'm like, this is stinking. And then I've gone, oh no. I need no, a shite. Oh need a my God. So then I've had a terrible, I've had like triple crown, like, and I've cleaned, I've cleaned the place up the best I can. I'm spraying Rod's deodorant and all that, right? Like South Africa. <laughs> Rod's got the mitch on it. Roll on. And uh, I've gone out and uh, I'm like sitting there sweating, look like Casper the ghost. I'm fucked. And uh, Rod Stewart comes in and he goes, You okay, son? And I'm like, I'm all right. I, I like looking like renting off train spot. And he goes, See, the thing about these posh hotels, you tend to find they always have problems with the plumbing. <laughs> I'm like, I Rod. <laughs> So I remember thinking, this is what it's going to be like. This is what life's going Amazing, to be like for man, me. Eh? And it, it kind of was like that for 10 years, really. Just well, like, see how you're saying, be professional in that, and like, if you want to do well, but then is I, there also that other side where you've got to kind of go off the cuff to, and like, just I, enjoy I, I it? I couldn't uh -huh. say to no, I'm away at my bed. Uh, no, exactly. Because uh, yeah. I've got work tomorrow. It'd have been like, right, cheerio, I'll never speak to you again. Yeah. And uh, and that's, I always had to be the last one to leave because, uh, you know, you didn't want to miss anything. So if my missus, if you're watching this, I need to go at the yeah. night with Gordon Smart it's before in the morning. Me, you, Compton and Jerry Cinnamon. Josh Taylor. Wow. Uh, you, um, I'd leather Taylor out sing singing. <laughs> <laughs> I'd fucking love to see that. Uh, right, around about that time right. as well, mate. Um, Hibs are hitting a purple patch. Aye. Riordan, O'Connor, Brown, Thompson, Fletcher are coming through. Yeah, Were you keeping team. tabs on Hingdon in London? Oh, massively, yeah. Well, it was a bit of a weird thing because I was seeing all my football in London. Like, I lived in London, right? Did you go to in London? Aye, English I was, games, I was uh -huh. in football in London all the time, yeah. I used to go and see a lot of West Ham, a lot of Chelsea, a lot of Arsenal. I was there, I was there all the time. But I was playing a lot then as well. So I was playing for a, an amateur team in, in London, which was interesting. Chappers from Radio 1. Right, okay, Chapman. Uh -huh. Yeah, uh -huh. he was our centre half. Uh, the guy that ran Babe Station played for us. Did he? Uh, we had a few others. Like, uh, I tell you who got involved a couple of times. I think I'm getting this right. Do you remember uh, Kieran McInespy? Because uh, he, he was at Fulham, Mac is a pal of mine. Right. So what a boy. So when Mac, Mac moved to London, I got on tour with him because he didn't really ken anybody. And uh, we had loads of mutual pals. So I knew some boys in the Chelsea youth team. He was at Fulham. And uh, we all ended up in a world of trouble, just boozing and misbehaving. But Mac was a mate of mine. What so he wasn't getting a game for Fulham. And I think he turned up and played a couple of times. Right. Against the contract, and uh, but it was an interesting wee team. So I, at that time, you're right. Hibs were an amazing team. I mean, the, I followed Hibs religiously between about '94 and 2001. Like really, like I went to every game of the season in the year we got relegated. We were right. top of the league after three games, right? Uh -huh. Jimmy Boko, who played for us, missed, him missed, him, missed, mate, he missed a one-on-one -on -one against Rangers for us to go four-one up. We lost four-three, right? We got relegated that season. Grant Brebner played for us. He was fucking brilliant. Set, oh, midfielder, oh, good player. Uh -huh. From Man United. Yeah, Still yeah, best uh -huh. mates with Phil Neville and all that. Is he right? Brebs. All the names that you've mentioned. Ask all the Hibs boys about Brebner. He uh -huh. was a rascal. Like, well, love him. most of the stories about Brebner you can't tell. I know, you uh -huh. can't. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah. But Few, what a player. Uh -huh. I, I, but he was, he was kicking around at the time. So I followed him religiously. Went to every game of that season until the last game. We got relegated against Kelly. And uh, we, were go we were meant to go. And I crashed the car. And reversed into the bank in Kinross. Smashed the car. Wasn't he paying attention? Really, right? Probably so rammed into the, the bank. Game? I so my brother was raging. He's like, oh, fuck it. We missed the game. We were relegated. But I, I went to so much. So that's the season we got to the Scottish Cup final 2000. Yeah, I, I actually was doing work experience at Radio 4th. A guy, Donkey Donaldson, Mark right. Donaldson. And Donkey did my radio package with me for the radio. I interviewed John O'Neill and Latape and all that. And McLeish. And that was that was my last part of university. And that Hibs team, that, that's the one I felt closest to because I knew them off of the club and the youth team right. and all that. But then when I moved to London, see, see that team for like from afar was unbelievable. So exciting, wasn't it? And I'd come back and just think, oh, I was watching Chick Charlie playing in the centre midfield 
with Ray Wilkins, combined age of about 408, <laughs> right? <laughs> we were pish. Like, there was a spell, Jim Duffy was the manager. Jail time relegated. of 100 years with Chick as well. Chico. <laughs> oh, yeah. But uh, Chick was brilliant. I remember, uh, actually, I was at uh, Henrik Larson's debut for Celtic. Against well, yeah, Hibs. right, when Charlie scored. Gave the ball away. Yeah. Charlie takes it on the half turn, top corner, peach. And oh, it was Larson's that. first touch in Scottish football. I remember football. that. Yeah. I was at that game. Wow. So like, I was also at the game when Gaza booked the referee. That was oh, were you right? Was that the, Hibs? It was at Ibrox. I think it was the semi-final of the Scottish Cup. And it was at Ibrox for some reason against Celtic. Against Rangers, I It would have been I. It would have been at home. But I was at that game. Did it make it more exciting that all these boys I, were local like Edinburgh lads that were Hibs fans as well? I, was, uh, you kind of felt like Identify they cared. with them. Uh, you felt like they cared for the club, which was amazing. Who like, was your favourite? Are they, they fine? I thought Kevin Thompson was brilliant. Great player. I mean, he's just, I mean, I played centre midfield and he's just so composed. He seemed to have an extra second on the ball all the time. Stylish, wasn't he? Ah, he was stylish. Yeah. A mate of mine, a guy called Gary Gofillin, who you might know, Gary played uh, Cowden Beath and all that. He played with Derek Ryan. He went on loan to Cowden Beath. And I remember him saying to me, this boy, right foot, left foot, Finishing is the best it, yeah. finisher I've ever seen. And it keeps coming up in your podcast yeah. as well. And he, rather than on a corner, man, they were Brilliant, and what and there were nuggets which made the haircuts. <laughs> Fucking, but, but also I, remember, I seem to remember Gary Batter than Elvis impersonator one night in Preston Pans, and I was like, "This is what I want from Hibs. <laughs> this is what I want from Hibs." Uh, uh, Tony Mowbray as well. Aye, Re- revolutionised Mother. Hibs. He was great, and you could tell he had a relationship with the players, uh-huh. and the players wanted to play for him. And I was kind of sad about how all that ended, really, because I, I genuinely believe one more season with that crop of players, we would have won the league. Guys, O'Connor said that. I just don't, I don't, I don't understand why the club and that. Hibs frustrate me like that. Is it Rod Petrie? Yeah, I mean, I don't understand why they, they couldn't see it. Everybody could see it. And by the way, one more season, the player value is not going to drop. It's going to go up. Just keep them one more year together. And mm. that would have been my... And I'll, I'll always... I still dream about it. Still daydream about what yeah, that team uh-huh. could have done. David Murphy, the left back. He could what play. a player. He to Birmingham, didn't he? Uh-huh. What a he player was a he was. Player. But that midfield as well, the boys weren't even getting a game. I mean, it was fantastic, and Stephen Fletcher would have been coming through at the he time as well. He was even right? younger, but he probably had been getting on. Getting sub, on at time, 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 time. Did you ever, uh, did you ever meet any of that lot? Did you ever see them at the tune? Obviously, Deeks was banned to every place. Was I, can you remember seeing him get well, huckled in? Or? Weirdly though, because I was in London at that point, I was nearly out in Edinburgh much. Right, I'd, co- I'd come back. Tell you when I start, I started bumping into Anthony Stokes and Graham Stack. Oh, Stack's I, mental. I, I loved Stacky. Like uh-huh. Stacky was brilliant. I had a few good nights with him, but that was a wee bit after. I do have a recollection though of Derek Rardin that he might not remember and he probably wouldn't appreciate me tell, appreciate you telling it but I, I love it. He <laughs> doesn't care mate. Deeks. One of my favourite games as a Scotland fan was when we played Brazil at the Emirates in London. Right. What a day out that was. Right. right? What a day out <clears> that was. And we were walking into the game and we hired a pub and we ended up like 500 Tartan Army at this pub that we'd hired and I was walking into the game and I looked to my left and I thought he looks familiar. He had the, the CU Jimmy Tammy on and a bottle of Buckfast. I said, Derek, Fucking Ryden. He should have been playing in that game. Uh-huh. And I remember thinking, Deke, fuck's sake, He was man. doing that on he was, the, <laughs> the book first. <laughs> he, he was good enough in my book to be playing that day. Yeah. And it, uh, that upset me. And then I remember thinking, it's a shame because he didn't realise his potential. And he probably knows it himself, but what a player. Was that, was that the best Hibs team you've seen? Yeah, the, the, cup, the cup winning team with John Collins. Yeah. Yeah, that team. That was 2007, wasn't it? Uh, 2006. 2006, I think 2006, it was. Uh-huh. I was at the cup final and I remember thinking, this is magic. I love we were uh, buzzing when Collins took over because he was Hibs hero now. He was I played against him a couple of times. Did actually. you? Right? Aye, so Kano, did he show you six pack? You did. Did aye, he? He did. Was aye. tremendous? He's in some shape. Like, aye, he's in some shape. You know what as well? I gave him a run around. Did you? I, fucking, I played really well. Aye, we played seven aside at uh, World of the Football. And it was like, that, that was the ultimate day for me because it was all the old Hibs boys. So Paul Kane, Gordon Hunter... Gordon Ray played, John Collins, can't mind who else was playing that day, but uh, John Collins played for them and I played another team and uh, he was he was fit, like, he yeah. was fit. And I was I was really sharp at the point, I was doing triathlons. Yeah. So I was fit as a fiddle. The days have obviously <clears> gone now. Thank you very much, Simon. <laughs> Wait till you reach 40, my man. See how much hair you've got then, pal. And uh, uh, he, was, he was brilliant. Yeah, John, and I, again, like, I wish I could, I would like, you know, having worked in management and newspapers and stuff like that, I would love to be involved to help manage people, right, at a football club. That was my next question. Because you know? John Collins, clearly led by example, as an athlete, as he knew his stuff, right, he could speak languages. What a great role model. But I think he pissed the players off. Right? Yeah. Like, look, this is what it should be. Because they're not going to respond to that, are you? No. And I think if he'd had a good man-manager with him, 
it could have it could have worked much better. Uh, right, no, just Hibbs. I want to hear about other famous footballer faces that you've met. Starstruck. Oh, Wayne I'll... Rooney, man, that picture you sent me. Ah, yeah, so I've done loads of Rooney over the years, right. which is appropriate given what's going on this Happy. last few days, eh, with Vardy and. And Colleen. you brought Vardy into the sun, huh? Ah, it was all me. I <laughs> listen. Fucking the stories Rooney told me much better than that. <laughs> 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 no, no, I, love, I really like Wayne Rooney. Really, is he top really man, like is he? Huh? Yeah, really good lad. I saw his, uh, might have been his debut actually for Everton at Hibs pre season. Me and my brother went, because we were that, in the Hibs. He right. was 16. And I remember thinking, who's this pit bull terrier that brought he's a on? Unit, wasn't he? Just like, and he was quick though. You thought he's going to be fucking powerful. Yeah. And he, he got booked in the first 30 seconds, I remember, just like piling into a tackle. But yeah, I've done a lot with Rooney. I went on Street Striker twice. Oh, that thing with the Techers, that Techers guy. Aye, aye, aye. Pain in the arse. Aye, it was, but <laughs> what a great programme that was. I loved it. <laughs> it was great, wasn't it? But Rooney's like, see when you sit like this, great crack. And they put the cameras on, he'd be like, aim, right, so Gordon, aim, <laughs> right, mates, aim. I'm like, why? Crack. I just think all, he's not good at all that stuff. Yeah. He's not good at it. He's great crack away from it, I thought. But I mean, some of the stories with him are so funny. Like, he, um, here's a good one for you, right? Right, go for it. I remember, again, this must have been 10 years ago, 12 years ago. Noel rang me and said, Oh, fucking hell, something special's happening. You've got to get involved in this. So he had, um, Colleen had sent a guitar to Noel to sign for Wayne Rooney's birthday. Right, fucking Man United striker sends <laughs> Man City, like the biggest Man City fan I've ever met, uh -huh. sends him a guitar. So Noel and Gem, who was an Oasis, they were an Oasis at the time. They've stripped the strings off the guitar and painted it sky blue. <laughs> and then, right. And then written the lyrics to Blue Moon on it. And uh, in the middle, Node, Node said, uh, Happy birthday, Shrek. Oh, <laughs> oh, oh, the best, oh, the best you read. <laughs> and, uh, so, right enough. Like, it took a lot of persuasion, but I, I ended up squeezing it in the paper with the pictures and all the rest of it. And it's Rooney's prized possession, eh? Fair play to me. He, he keeps thought it, it was funny, funny huh? It's funny. But, like, we'd loads of great crack like that. You know, I, I'll tell you one of the funniest ones. Right? I nearly got me in the sack. It was um, a number of times. But David Bentley. What so, a guy. Right, so we, I'm involved in this club night called This Feeling, right? So we give guitar bands a big break, you know, your chance to so give Blossoms, Catfish and the Bottleman, uh, wow. Sabian, a DJ there, Arctic Monkeys, all that used to come down. And then... Um, Bentley loved his music, right? So he'd come down to see these bands. And I remember one night we had Jet, this Australian band on. And we, again... Is we that were, how you going to be, be my, my girl? girl. Yeah. So we're leathered, right, with Bentley. And um, so I turn up the next day at work. Uh, top of my list is like Big Night Out with David Bentley, Spurs star. Um, he comes along to support guitar music. Just a wee story for the paper, you know. Top of the news list. So I'm sitting in conference with Rebecca Wade, who's the editor at the time. And I go last. My showbiz list's last. So it's news, pictures... Uh, politics, uh, sport, then showbiz. I'm sitting last, like still drunk from the night before. Like, oh, <coughs> fucking help! I've got to stand and speak in front of all these important folk, like uh -huh. reeking. And the news editor goes first, and he's like, "Well, David Bentley, Spurs star, is in a bit of trouble this morning because he crashed his Porsche at seven o'clock this morning, uh, a number of times over the drink drive limit." And uh, we're just trying to work out where he was last night. Top of my list is like <laughs> pictures of me with David Bentley <laughs> drink. And I was like, it comes to my list and I'm like, well, no easy way to tell you, but I was out with David Bentley. <laughs> so did they buzz off that or are they raging at you? Um, they, they were laughing at the time, uh -huh. but actually it was pretty serious. Yeah. And, yeah. and also, why didn't he get a fuck? He was on about 90 grand a week or something stupid. Get a taxi, you prick, you know? Then he'd be daft. Steel arm Brazil's line. So that was a good that was a good crack. But at that time, we were knocking around quite a lot and like some of the funny stories, like I went to Madrid with Beckham. I mean, that was one of my one of the best. How did, that, how did you get that? So he was at uh, Madrid and I think he was about to move to LA Galaxy and they were kind of concerned about how it would be reported in the press. And at that point I was just about to become the showbiz editor, so that would have been 2007, 2006. And uh I think they wanted to kind of get me on side to make sure that I'd kind of look after them a bit and right. you know write about them in a favourable way, you know, so it wasn't like he follows Hollywood, showbiz, pish, all that. And fair play, it worked a treat. Me and Kate went out uh, with Beckham and Posh to uh, Madrid and went to the game. And the worst thing was he got suspended, so he wasn't playing in the game, which was a shame because I wanted uh, to see him. Yeah. But it was an amazing game. It was 4-3 uh, Real Madrid v Espanyol. Fat Ronaldo, not Zidane. All, the Galacticos, <laughs> all, of them, all of them. And then after the game, we went out for dinner, went on the piss, and he was world class. Was he? Like, it's the first time I met him, but it was good because I knew... Grant Brebner, so I'd said, like, oh, you know Brebs? And he said, like, how the fuck do you know Grant Brebner? Brebner? And that was it, off we went, you know. What and does he drink, beer? 
Uh, no, he was on red wine. He was red wine. Did he get steam into? Oh, I where he could drink, like where he could drink, and oh, he was yeah. great crack. And what did he speak? Did he he, speak about he football? spoke Spanish, talked loads of football with him. But it was because I was I was in his ear, like you know, just it was great crack, and I, I hope he enjoyed it that night as well. Yeah. He told me so many good stories. Like I'm sure he doesn't mind me telling you now, like, but uh, I was saying like, what was it like when you walk in the dressing room and you got Fat Ronaldo? <laughs> I didn't call him that, but uh-huh. and Roberto Carlos and Zidane, and he was like, he was totally cool with it. He's like. Oh, you know, I think I've earned my right to be there. Yeah, yeah. Said, but what was funny was uh, Brooklyn went with him. So Brooklyn's a wee boy, and he's, he said, I've just had a shower and I'm toweling myself down. And he says, Roberta Carlos walks out naked, standing there. Don't know why I looked at him. Do you have a look, Simon? <laughs> You're not in the dressing room now. And he says, uh, Brooklyn just goes like that. He goes, Dad, Dad, why don't you have a thingy like that? <laughs> <laughs> and he's like, I'm, I'm David Beckham. <laughs> Is that not so good he's enough? not got it all. Is that not good enough? No, for you? Do you know oh, what a story that is. All those stories are great. See, see with yeah. that, do you get more starstruck with footballers? Or oh, definitely. Famous, right. Yeah, I mean, or like musicians who. Definitely, definitely footballers. Have you ever been starstruck? Yeah, yeah. Properly. Beckham. Uh, Beckham a wee bit. Yeah. Sean Connery. Oh yeah. I mean, yeah. That's that. Sean Connery. I, I bumped into him in a toilet in London, and I'm writing this book called Slash Gordon, right? Which is uh, the most famous person you've had a pish beside. <laughs> so I've got 180 <laughs> stories, right? right? Nearly 200 now. Of famous folk who've had a pish beside somebody famous. I ask it to everybody I interview. And everyone's got a story. Everyone's got a story. And mine, it's the whole idea for the book came from, I was in the, the Langham, which is a restaurant. Uh, again, Rod Stewart's favourite restaurant in London. And again, steaming in the bog <laughs> on my own. Like, rat arsed. And I heard all these folk coming into the toilet. And I was like, why are so many folk coming in at the same time? And I've turned around and Sean Connery stands at the cubicle, the urinal right next to me. And I'm like, Fuck, I've always wanted to meet you, you're my hero. What did I say to, to my hero? I've got one chance to get this right. And he's got like, all the folk, the security guards and stuff had been with him because he'd been at a premiere. And I just looked at him and he looked at me and I said, Sean, can I just say, it's a real honour to meet you. And he just looked at me and said, now's not really the time, is it, Sean? <laughs> <laughs> had a good look at his cock as well. <laughs> <laughs> Big old Sean Sean Connery's got a weapon on him. So you've got you've had a hun- you've so had 180 pisses of from that Peter. day. I always the reason I was like I wonder who the most famous person is Sean Connery's had a pee beside. So after that day, everybody I've interviewed in the last 15 years, whatever I've it is, asked. I've asked, and some of the stories are unbelievable, like brilliant. Like Beckham's come up loads of times as answers. Um, you know, everyone always says I bends it to the right slightly. I can. <laughs> but the, the best story, one of the best stories I heard was. Um, uh, the drummer from the Killers, Ronnie Venucci, right? Great, right. Like, really interesting guy. And he was playing, Killers were playing this NBA celebration dinner, this private dinner just for the players. And he's dead nervous because he loves basketball. He said, There's two cubicles in a dressing room, really tight together, like too tight together. And he's, he's fucking nervous and he's having a piss. And he feels the door open and then this massive presence beside him. And he's like, Shaquille O'Neal. And he's like, you didn't even want to be having a piss. piss. Like, so he said, stage fright kicks in straight away. And he says, you can see Shaquille O'Neal laughing. And he's like, what do you do? What do you do? He's like, I can't piss, I can't piss. And he said, Shaquille O'Neal was like, rolled it out. Like, you know. Wow. <laughs> and, he and he said, he's looked across and Shaquille O'Neal's winked at him. And he said to him, he went, Shaq, nice watch. <laughs> That's Great. tremendous. Nice man. watch. So I've got, like, I've got all these stories. and like people, I got a piss with uh, Kevin Nolan. The I, 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 Bowen, uh, yeah. Uh, Christmas doing I was steaming the same as aye. you went in the toilets it was mobbed in Newcastle aye, aye. Uh, is it Top Top it used to be called aye, aye, aye. so I've shouted there's a room for a little one <laughs> and Kevin no one's buzzed off that he's like fucking get in here man. Son, so I'm standing next to him it's rammed me and I start aye. pissing and it, he get the splashback goes all in his jeans mate and he goes fucking hell little man you're pissing all over me fuck off <laughs> See, so you're right everyone everyone's got a story has. If you're, I'm what gonna an get, idea, yeah, Slash Gordon as well, eh? But it's like the stories are absolutely brilliant. Like Knowles is great. Knowles, uh, Knowles having a piss at an awards do, and Brian Ferry comes and has a piss next to him, and Knowles just started whistling "Jealous Guy." Oh, you know, the solo from "Jealous Guy," class, like tremendous. I went to launch the England away strip strip with Kasabian in Paris, right? And uh, I'm wearing a Scotland strip. They've got England strips on, even though Serge is Italian and Tom's Irish, <laughs> with a French crowd. I don't know whose idea it was. We're getting bottled on stage. Right? And the kid said to me, you've got to be back because Jimmy was due. Like, she was nine months pregnant in Scotland, ready to burst, because Kate came back to have the baby here. Like, right. You did the Archie Gemmel, you've got to come home. Come home back. So Kate's here, ready to give birth. I'm in Paris on the promise that I will come back to be there for Jimmy to be born. And I've woke up, woken up, looked at my phone and it says you're now entering Belgium I thought oh fuck 
<laughs> I've looked at the next message and now entered in the Netherlands. Text messages, you know how you get the alerts yeah, from your abroad? Yeah. I'm like, oh, you're a fucker, that's not good. The next one's Kate going, where the fuck are, are you? you? Can't... <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, oh, that's bad. And then it's like, again, another 50 missed calls. I'm in this wee black room. I'm like, fuck, where am I? I had no idea where I am, right? And I keep, all I knew is I had my passport in my pocket. And I've like rolled out this wee black room and I'm on the tour bus, the Kasabian tour bus. They had a gig in Amsterdam the next night. I've fallen out, like, back, like covered in cuts and all sorts of stuff. Like, oh, fuck. And Tom Meehan, the front man of the band's in his pants and he went, Fucking hell, that got out of hand, eh? And I'm going, what am I doing? What am I doing? I'm like panicking, like, what the fuck am I doing here? He's like, we're in Amsterdam, you're coming to the gig. I'm like, I'm not coming no, to the yeah. fucking gig. Take me to the airport. So they took me to Schiphol Airport in Amsterdam. I've run up to like KLM and said, I need to get a flight to anywhere in Scotland, how much? And they're like, well, there's one going to Edinburgh in about 45 minutes, you can just about get that, it's 900 quid. I'm like, oh, fuck, handed the credit card over, run through, it's a massive airport, I'm like sweating, I don't know where my stuff, I've got my wallet, I've got my, I've got my passport in my wallet, got on the plane, landed in Scotland, got home, and uh, Kate's in labour, gone to Kirkcaldy, had Jimmy, and then they kick, <laughs> this, is the, this is the worst part, right? they kick me out because you've got 24 hours that you're not allowed to see yeah. after the baby's born, so everything was fine, Jimmy's great, a magical experience, I'm there for the whole thing. And I'm like, well, what am I going to do for 24 hours? And it was the Brits. So I went back to London, went to the Brits. No way. I wet the baby's head with, with Compton and all that, Kasabian and all that are back by this point. Buzzing off you. Gone all nighter. Like a proper, like massive celebration. Wet the Amazing. baby's head with Noel and Kasabian and all that. We've gone daft and I've got the first flight back the next day, coming to visit now. I was at Kirkcaldy without going to bed, steaming again. <laughs> What so a life, mate. It was great times. But Tremendous. Mate, yeah, I love Kasabian. Ah, they're Serge brilliant. and Tommy, ah, so cool, aren't they? We've had great times with them. Uh, they top lads, are huh? Lovely players. Tom's off it, so he's, so, oh, he's, he's mental. He's mental. <laughs> so Serge, Serge is one of the best footballers I've... He's, he's, well, he's done that in soccer then three times, didn't he? He's flipped up and volleyed Class it. Class player. He was, he was at Nottingham... Uh, Leicester as a youth. His dad ran Nottingham Forest Youth, or he was one of the coaches in Nottingham Forest Youth team. And his dad played for Man. You don't. Nobody knows this, I think. His dad played at Manchester United. He was in the digs at United as a young man. Was he? Richard Pizzorno. In the same era as George Best. Imagine the stories you. he's got. And he's never, he never talks about it. I've probably told the story. We need story to get Serge on the podcast. He, he, you should. He's brilliant. And yeah. it's just funny because I don't see him as much as I used to. Like, went to his wedding. We went, we went right. to Serge's wedding. And Crouchy, we're Crouchy. Uh-huh. And uh, Crouchy, we're in, at the wedding, after party, all the rest of it. And everyone's taking a shot to DJ. And Crouchy's like, I've got, I've, I'm going to drop some fucking bombs here. Watch this. And he's gone up and put Phil Collins on. Fucking everyone's <laughs> emptied the dance floor. <laughs> Crouchy emptied the dance floor. Like. That's some good nights with Crouchy. Like. Uh, we're going to call the crowd, Jack. I've got a bit in here. I like, had a fight with Jay-Z as well, eh? No way. I gave him a bad review. Mate, uh, we're only half a tip, but this is my favourite interview. Just so you know. Uh, <laughs> I'm boring you to tears, No, eh? mate, it's tremendous, I can talk a glass of ice. I had a fight with Jay-Z. Um, I gave him a pretty ropey review for Glastonbury. So I, I saw him at Glastonbury. And about, I, I can't even mind how how close it was before that he played Albert Hall and it was amazing one of the best gigs I've been to right he had like 10 other artists came out and performed with him like Coldplay played with him yeah, I can't remember he had, he had all sorts of folk on stage it was great and then he played Glastonbury and there's all these folk that didn't normally go to Glastonbury worried about getting their trainers dirty and I was like this isn't what it's fucking sure. all about and I gave him quite a tough review anyway I, I got invited to see him and meet him and I went I'll come down and see him there's a great pic- there's pictures of it it's funny as fuck right. And I've walked into this like, private members club downstairs in London and he's got all these entourage from New York there and they're all smoking, like seriously smoking. The place is like a fucking hot box. I've walked in in a suit, right? Like CID, <laughs> look like fucking Compton, right? DSR that showed up, right? But I had an indie haircut at the time yeah. as well, like long hair. And I've walked in and he's walked straight across to me and he just said, you're a motherfucking non-believer, man. And I was like, Fuck you! I was, I'd had a drink again. Uh-huh. And I was like, "Don't come up to me, fucking pointing at me like that." Fuck you! Like, sworn back at him, and he thought, "Oh, I wasn't expecting this from a journalist." Yeah. And I was like, "Don't come up pointing your chest, pointing your finger at my fucking chest." Let's talk about that review. I gave you one of the best reviews I've given anybody about six months before that. Though, but hold, oh, do you remember that? And he's gone, "Oh no, no, I don't." And I was like, "Yeah, well, in fairness, I don't think Glastonbury was as good as that, and I don't think hip hop works at Glastonbury." That's my view. So don't fucking come over. And he's like, oh, fair play. Sit down, let's have a drink. So I sat down with him and we've had a, uh, an old-fashioned sitting drinking whiskey. And he's oh, asking, yeah. asking me about Scotland, the music, and I sat with him 15 minutes. 
and there's great pictures of him like pointing in my chest like that. Is it right? And there's a picture of me going, <laughs> fuck you back like that. So would you never get intimidated now? Oh, I'm shiting it. My arsehole was going Go at the time. Like, cause, and by the way, his mates are all probably carrying guns at that yeah. point, you know? Because he's very pure underground New York. But you know, so yeah. you've, you've got to front it up, haven't you? Despite yeah. how much your arsehole's going like a 50 Have you got to do this, and you need to... And also, sometimes if you just... And I learned that, actually, at the newspaper, because there are a lot of bullies there. And you have to stand up to you for yourself. And if you don't, you will be trodden over relentlessly. And uh, listen, if we'd ended up rolling around on the floor, like, he would have won. But yeah, they made a great story, as well. a great story, though. Um, what was I going to say there? Uh, the Gallagher's, have they got a Scottish team? There's no oh, speed no team? Celtic, that, is there? I so do you, Celtic. Do you have a wee bit of banter between that now? The last, last time we were laughing, he came up to see Celtic <sighs> at home. Um, and Jason Cummings went up and asked him for a picture. And he, he just sent me the picture of Jason Cummings and was like, is this what represents Hibs now? Footballers wearing fucking leggings. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, that's his image of fucking Hibs now. <laughs> Jason Cummings coming up. They're going like, he's speaking his tattoo. And he went. <laughs> but uh, he, he, he loves the atmosphere at Celtic. And there's some funny pictures of him, actually. There's a good picture of my Celtic scarf back in the 90s. Like, I have yeah. seen that, actually. I mean, uh... No sports Ireland the head of England, right? Oh, does he, right? Ah, he's, he's Irish. His mum's peg, you know? His mum uh, 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 and dad are both Irish, like, right. so... Ah, he's proper, proper Irish. Uh, as you spoke about sticking up for yourself, I loved it when you stuck up for Capaldi with an Ollie. Fuck hell, that was a moment as well, eh? What, we, when men, Ollie. Uh, he did, eh? Aye. Uh, well, Why were you so angry? I think, leading up to it, like, you've got to remember Noel gets asked these leading questions all the time. Yeah. Because he did it with Jay-Z as well, didn't he? Did he, right? So, this happens, like, every six... Every time Noel's doing promo, he'll arm somebody out and get battered uh -huh. for it for ages. Yeah. But, uh, Lewis... I knew it was going to happen because um, I'd mentioned, he'd asked me about what you're listening to at the moment. I said, there's this wee guy from Scotland that I love called, but he's funny as fuck. And he just looked at me and went, and there's, <laughs> he's so fucking dismissive when he wants to be. Like, right. you, you didn't want to get the cold front. Like, I've been, I've been in the bad books for about a year and a half. Uh -huh. It's fucking just thawing now, but oh, it's horrible. What, because of the Capaldi stuff? No, 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 no. no, no. For, for there, another yeah. monumental fuck up on a night out. Right. It's entirely my own doing. <laughs> Ah, <laughs> oh, fuck, I really, I don't see him as much as I used to, I really miss him actually, but um, yeah, it was my own doing, but yeah, he, he just went at him, and I was like, you know what, I think I know you well enough to say, fucking calm down by the way, he's uh -huh. brilliant. But see, when he was slotting him, were you getting the butterflies thinking, well, I want to stick up for Capaldi here? Uh, no, no, I, I, see, we know now, you sometimes have to go against the grain, because uh -huh. otherwise, like, you're just a yes man, aren't you? Uh -huh. I'm always arguing the so toss. So you planned it before <clears throat> that you knew he was going to slaughter Capaldi I, and you were going to stick I knew, up for him? I knew Capaldi would work because he, he doesn't like the music. He, he's he got this thing about Scott, like, his relationship with Comston is one of the funniest ever. Right. They were best friends for about 15 minutes <laughs> and then he fucking hated them. <laughs> it was, Why? Like, so spectacularly overstepped the mark. After Tea in the Park, we all came back here. So no headline Tea in the Park, we came back to the house. And Noel was in the hump with me because I told him it was five minutes around the corner. I've been getting out of fucking Straff Island. Took about two days. Came back here. We'd all had a proper drink. And no uh, Martin, by the way, we'd been on a four day at this point. Right. And unbeknownst to Martin, like every time he was looking, we had this girl had given us a, like a hairspray full of Jägermeister. So every time he looked away, I sprayed his head. Like, <laughs> so by the end of the weekend, <laughs> <laughs> his head was black like, sticky black like, he kept going I'm worried about my sweat like, my head's really sticky every time he was looking sh -sh -sh. so like you got to imagine he'd gone upstairs steaming constant and come back with his Celtic strip on thinking no would love that and uh, he's come back down with a black head like steaming shouting at no and I just think he was annoying him so much and Noel's missus is a Rangers fan oh that's right and Compton started on her going you're a fucking zombie and all this kind of stuff <laughs> <laughs> so I it went a bit wrong there but you know it, it, it'll all be fine eventually I'm sure but uh -huh. I, I think in Noel's words his partner dries thin after a while <laughs> So your pal as well, Peter Dinnanoth, he's your really pally with the script and busted as well. Aye. Well, One Direction. Are you pally with them? Aye, One Direction. I did their media training when they first started off, eh? No way. Aye, so I... I Could you tell straight away they were going to be huge, eh? I, no, I thought they were shite. Did you, right? I thought they were absolutely shite when they started. So, I, I don't know if you remember this, but I did four series of X Factor. Oh, so you did that? Aye, so I was the pundit, like the Alan Hansen, yeah, yeah, yeah. angry pundit. It was great. I had a great time doing that, by the way. Amazing times. But I saw them all come through, so I did a bit of media training. I work, still work with Lee Thomas and did a bit with him last week. Right. Um, He's a big football nut guy as well. But, Doncaster, uh, isn't he? I, I uh, thought Doncaster, he, he had so. money in them and all uh -huh. that. But he, what's interesting is people always say, all you did was write about Kasabian and Oasis. But actually, I wrote more about One Direction and JLS and <laughs> fucking all that piss, yeah. Oh, that's not for me. Spice could not mean either. Uh -huh. uh, just on Capaldi, yeah. what would you rather, 
Um, win the lottery or have his head full of pound coins. Some size of head, isn't it? It's a mass. He's got, he has got the meatball, hasn't he? Oh, my God. The Lego head. Is he a top man to it? Because he he's mentioned up and go before on his Instagram. Story. We were Get buzzing, him on. Man. Get him on. I have tried, put, but I'll, I'll he's a man it. in demand, isn't he? His life. I had him on the radio. He's an Olympic Celtic fan. Sorry. I, 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 no, no. He, I had him on the radio 20, November 2017, right, two years ago, and he came in. And I was just pissing myself laughing. I had this song called Fade that I loved, so I got him in. And my friends at the record label signed him. And they were like, this guy is brilliant. Like, he's so funny. But we just, once we get it right, it'll work. And sure enough, fuck me, he is flying at the moment. Can and you he, tell straight away with somebody here? Aye. Uh, you know what's amazing with him is he's got the talent to match the personality. His voice is brilliant. So when you get, like, Sam Fender's the same, unbelievably talented. And Lewis, he's just, he's got star, he's got star quality about him. It's amazing. Yeah. He... You know, he hasn't been blessed with the best looks, as he would tell you himself, uh -huh. but he is having the time of his life now. Wow. It's funny. he's doing bits, huh? Ah, he is. I know he is. Can, um, I'll tell you later. <laughs> <laughs> yes. uh, right, Peter Crouch. Crouchy, hi. How did Crouchy. you come pals with him as well? Um, Crouchy, I met him playing golf. I'm really into my golf. I love my golf. And I met oh, him you were Thomas Bjorn as well. Did you find ah, these balls? Fuck me, mate. How embarrassing is that? Brilliant, eh? So Thomas Bjorn, we're on a par three at this golf day, 185 yards. The first three lads put it on the green and my arse is gone already. <laughs> Ryder Cup captain. And I've wanged it into the shite. Like, not just the shite, like, really in the shite. Uh -huh. And everyone's pissing them. So there's loads of folk watching. And sure enough, he's fucking walking around looking for my ball. ball. <laughs> he got a hole in one about 10 minutes later. And did is he top man as well? Yeah, quite very quiet, very serious. But yeah. uh, fucking hell, was him. And he found my ball for me as well. So I was proud oh, yeah. of that. Uh, Crouchy. I met Crouchy playing golf and um, got chatting away to him. And I actually knew Abby first, Abby Clancy. So, uh, tremendous, isn't she? <laughs> she's she a, is tremendous. She's a lovely woman, uh -huh. so very talented, tremendous, capable uh -huh. woman. Aye, she's great. And uh, so I knew Abby, and Abby's wee brother's in a band called Lona. And I helped him out at the beginning. Did you not play football as well? He was acting as a kid. He was a big laddie, by the way, big gangly laddie. But he introduced, she introduced me to him and I helped him the music. And then we kind of all got pally. And I kind of met, he met the Kasabian lot through me and my mate Mikey. And we all became good friends. But when I, just when I left newspapers, I must have been a month out of the sun. No, it would have been a couple, it was February at the Brits. Crouchy was at Stoke. And he was on a curfew, right? So you've got to be back at your hotel by midnight or you're dropped. Because it would have been Wednesday night. It must have been playing Thursday. <laughs> and um, Abby and Crouchy were all, again, had a few drinks, like, reeking. And Abby's like, I'm going to be sick. I'm going to be fucking sick. I'm going to be sick. And I was like, all right, fuck, we'll go out the fire escape, be sick outside. Sure enough, I opened the fire escape and popped my head out and there's about a thousand paparazzi outside the Warner Brothers party. And I was like, Abby, just sneak out. Nobody's watching. So Crouchy's behind the door. Abby's there and I'm standing on my back to the paps. Like, bear in mind, I worked for the sun like <laughs> three months before and she's like, ah, dry, dry boken, like, Ugh. and I was like, fuck's sake. And she's holding her hair back and I'm like, fucking hell. I can't remember if I had her hair or not. And Crouchy's like, I can't come out. If they get a picture of me, I'm going to get in loads of trouble. Uh -huh. So sure enough, the paps turn around and start hammering the pictures. And I'm like, fuck off, lads. She cannot see she's not well. Fuck off. Fuck, leave her alone. And they're like, you've changed your tune, you prick. <laughs> So I'm in, in this rock with all these photographers. Anyway, it's ended up in the Daily Mail sidebar of shame. And in the picture, sure enough, you can just see like four inches of big crouching, like peeking out the door. So yeah, I think he, he got, did he get he, done I, for it? I think he got barred for that. Ah, yeah, I see, he's another thought. He's put out his podcast good as well. He is one of the nicest men you could ever meet. I genuinely think, what a good man. Uh -huh. Love him. Good really, part, isn't it? Ah, he's... You get him on. I'll help you get him on this. Really? Aye, aye, aye. aye. I'd love, guy, to, I'd yeah, love to help you with that. He's, he's such a funny bloke. Uh -huh, I would love, love to get him on. Uh -huh. uh, right, OK. In general, interviews. Favourite? Aye, favourite interview of all time. This is probably going to surprise you, right? Because it's not what you'd expect. But I went to interview Coldplay, right? In, uh, I know, in Salt Lake City, which is a Mormon city. Right. And um, the interview went really well. And he said, what are you doing now? I said, well... I'm going to fly back to London. So I flew to Salt Lake City for a day. I'm like, no, no, come on tour with us. So I was like, you sure? They're like, aye. So I rang the office and said, look, do you mind if I go on tour with Coldplay for a bit? So I spent a week on tour with Coldplay, which was, it might sound boring to you, but... No, that's but, mate, amazing for him, the biggest, it? Big, One of the biggest bands in the world uh -huh. at the time, right? And still My missus loves them, actually. Mate, yeah. got taken on the private jet. We flew to LA. They put me up in their hotel. They played the American Music Awards. I went to the American Music Awards with them, sat in the dressing room like this with them while they were warming up. I was playing football a wee bit with Johnny, the guitarist, and Will, the drummer, at the time, every Wednesday in, Edinburgh, in London. <clears throat> and um, So I met Justin Timberlake and Beyonce with them. Ron Jeremy came in the dressing no room. No way. Do you know who he is, do you? Ah, of course. But vintage for you, you know. That was me every... 
every night of the week. Yeah, I've watched him every night of the week. Yeah. <laughs> Uncle Ron. So, uh, so I had this mad experience, and then I went to another awards ceremony with him that week, and um, I ended up on this night out, this crazy night out, really silly night out. Guy Berryman, Scottish, he's from Kirkcaldy. Right. right. So we ended up in the Chateau Marmont, the famous Chateau Marmont Hotel, and Coldplay's manager's best pals with Kate Bosworth, who was in Superman. Right. So she had a party. And I've ended up back in the swimming pool at Kate Bosworth's house. Who was there? God, a lot of folk. Uh-huh. I better, I should maybe be Does saying. Chris Martin get on it now? Nah, he's, he's pretty sensible, right? But there's a mad story about that, right? Because we're in the dressing room at the awards ceremony and he said, um, he said they tell me, Gordon, you, you, you like a drink? And I'm like, aye. And he warms his voice up with whiskey, right? So he gargles whiskey and he's got like a paint stripping machine that puts the vapours in his, his nose to warm up his vocal cords, which I thought was wanky at the time. Uh-huh. As you can hear from my voice, I've got to do it now as well, uh-huh. eh? <laughs> So I was laughing at him and he went, I bet you $200 you wouldn't down that whiskey. And it was like, it was about, I don't know, close to, there was a serious measure in right. it, like half pint. <laughs> so I thought, fucking right, I will. I did it. And they were all like, ooh, that's going to cause some trouble later uh-huh. on. So anyway, but an hour later, I'm like, yeah! It's like steaming at this party. And like Christina Hendricks thought I was the keyboard player and fucking Coldplay. And I'm, <laughs> I'm going along with it, like, got my arm around fucking like uh, Larry, Larry, what's his name? Uh, Larry David, like fucking annoying. Why are you Larry just, David in that? Just being a Scottish nuisance, like uh, proper. Pest. I, I constant it. Like, I was, I was, <laughs> I was in. There's no cause I'm Scotland's least stylish nuisance. <laughs> so I've fucking, I've gone daft in a, yeah, that, that was a while. But anyway. Kate's mum, Leishman's wife, died not long after that and uh, I got a letter off Chris Martin and he said, Gordon, I understand that I didn't honour the bet. I think I promised you $200 for downing that whiskey. With the exchange rate and all the rest of it, I think you'll find that's now £2,000. Here's the first donation for your mother-in-law's charity. No way. So, like, <clears throat> aye, so... What a top man. People don't see that side of things, you know, and I think it's important that maybe you have to take a chance to just remind folk that that was great, you know, what a uh-huh. kind thing to do for me to damage my liver. <laughs> How did you do it? Uh, Ricky Gervais. I love Ricky Gervais. See, mate. the Ricky one's funny, right? So, Ricky. Afterlife was tremendous, wasn't oh, it? It's brilliant, eh? The oh, Office is my favourite show of all it's time. It's brilliant, isn't it? I've seen it you is, talk about that. Amazing. The, the thing is, I watched Afterlife on my own in London because I live there on my own and I was sitting there like, is this because I'm feeling vulnerable and sad? I'm crying, all uh-huh. fucking greeting. I was honestly. And he came in and I thought, he's been interviewed by everybody, you know. It Jimmy needs to be Fallon, a bit different here, do you think? Everyone. And I thought, I'm going to go for this. And he walked in and he sat down and they put the cameras on and I went, Look at the fucking state of you, Ricky, you fucking shit Santa Claus tramp. And he's like, right, I'm going to enjoy this. <laughs> so he said, I'll challenge you. He said, let's have an insult competition. And uh, he said, let's go as dark as you can. And honestly, we had to leave half of it because it got wow. so dark. And after that, he was just like, we're having such a good time. And we we're talking, he loves animals. So I was talking about Fletch and it was great, just swear, swearing at each other. What about interviews that you didn't enjoy? Is there any in particular? Oh, fucking loads of them. It's hard. I enough. really struggle with hip hop, to be honest. Right. As you, you know, know what, I gather. Uh, no, I like hip hop. I like the music, but the people, I just can't connect to them. They're just quite, quite fake. P, P Diddy, right? Sean Coombs, Puff Daddy, whatever the fuck you want to call him, <laughs> Puffy. He, um, I've had three dreadful experiences with him, like that make me. Like, I just want to fucking disappear when I think about them. Like, he came to my office once in London and uh, he got out of the car and I was told you needed to greet uh, Mr Coombs as he arrives. So I've come out, he's arrived in a Maybach, beautiful car, and he's got out. And I've gone, again, can't shake his hand, shake my hand. Eh? So that, that's how we shake hands, right? The hip-hop handshake has become so convoluted and rid- ridiculous. What do you do? So I've put my hand out and he's gone like this. He's gone like fucking... <laughs> And I'm standing there going like, oh, can, can you do that, right? right? And anyway, I said to him, right, so what we're going to do today? And he went, look, I'm going to stop you there. I'm not in the fucking mood today, right? So the less you speak to me, the better this is going to be. I've got like an hour with this guy. Yeah, yeah, and that's how it started. Anyway, he's demanded chicken soup at room temperature. So they've fucking wheeled in chicken soup for him. He's got a guy, he's got hardly any hair. There's a guy like crimping at his hair with this thing. He's got two fucking minders with him who are just standing staring at me, like trying to intimidate me. And in the end, I'm like, what, what is the fucking point of this? Uh-huh. But the guy who'd set it up was such a good guy. I couldn't... And that, if I was in that position now, I'd just say, do you know what? Fuck off. Would you? Uh-huh. Aye, aye, because it's like... Have you ever had to do that? Aye, a couple of times, aye. I'm trying to think whether I should tell you. I one. Actually, I'll tell you one. But, you know, you should do that. Because what you're doing in these interviews is trying to help that person, you know, come across What's better. Uh-huh. Sell something a lot of the time. Sell an album, sell a film, whatever it is. Whiskey. So hi, sell my whiskey, copper dog, available thirty two pounds <laughs> in most supermarkets and, and uh, duty free. But I um, 
the funniest one I ever saw was a boy I worked with uh, Sean Hamilton and interviewed Shaking Stevens. <laughs> Shaking <Shaking yeah>. Stevens. <laughs> and I'd he loved to tell him to fuck off. <laughs> he did, he told him to fuck yeah. off. It was brilliant. So Shaking Stevens, because uh, he, he, he said, oh, it's nice to meet you, Shaking. And he went, no, no, it's uh, Shaky with an apostrophe, <laughs> like Sting and Bono. It's just Shaky. And he oh, laughed. No. He laughed. Like, so Sean <laughs> laughed. And Shaky Stevens <laughs> leans over and slaps him in the face. <laughs> Slapped him in the face. <laughs> So Hoagie, the big photographer, who's a legend, right? Mm-hmm. Hoagie's taking pictures of every famous person ever, you know, from the Popes all the way through to Madonna and all that, Prime Minister's presence. And Hoagie put his camera away and went, you know what? You're the rudest person I've ever met. And I've met you loads over the years. Forget this. I'm not taking any fucking pictures. He walked out and Sean went, aye, cheers. Left them. Just Brilliant. left them. And he asked me for a cup of tea. So I'd, at this point in my career, I brought him a cup of tea. And he went, it's too hot. I need it. Oh, I need it. Oh. Oh, fuck off. Yeah. I had a funny one the other day, actually. I'm going to name him. Fuck Go it. For it. Jeremy Edwards, remember the actor? Yes. So Jeremy Edwards. Better than Rachel Stevens. <laughs> Aye. Yeah. Jeremy Edwards comes in, uh, comes up to me in a pub and he's like, Gordon, um, or he didn't even call me Gordon. He said, Look, I'm sorry, I, I saw you in here. And I, I've been thinking about this, but I've got to come across and say to you some of the stuff you did to me in the newspaper was just so out of line. It was really disgraceful. You know, I was going through a hard time and you knocked on my brother's door and asked him for stories about me. And he said, I just, I need to get that off my chest as part of something I'm going through in my life. I need to just say that to you. What you did was wrong. And now it's off my shoulders. I feel better and we can start again. And I'm like, I've never met you in my life before. And he's going, and I could see him starting to panic. And he said, but you know what I mean? The standards of journalism at the Sun newspaper and uh, fake stories and all the lies that you've printed. And he said, you know what I'm talking about? And I'm like, no, no, I don't know what you're talking about. And I could see him beginning to panic. And I said, are you sure you've got the right person? I'm Gordon Smart. And he was like, oh, yes, um, I meant Dominic Mohan, the guy before you. And I was like, so you're going to apologise to me now? You know, you've come across here and accused me of being inaccurate and a bad journalist for getting things wrong. You've come up to me, accused me of doing shit that's not right. What you got to say about that? And he's like, oh, I realise this is rather embarrassing, but you still represent them. I'm like, no, I left I left four years ago because I disagreed with a lot of what happened. So you're going to apologise? And he was like, well, yeah. And I was, what I wanted to do was... Pudgies. Hi. Head off uh, Stick my large Lego head. <laughs> but that's not going to help in six Craig months. Br- Craig Brown was similar in Munich. Aye, aye. No, <laughs> uh, right, back to the high bees. Aye. Best day of your hub's life. 21st of May 2016. Yeah. Even me, Jimmy knew it straight away, didn't he? Aye, aye, came in. Is it a big thing in the house? Or how? Amazing. Aye, it was so, so spectacularly good. I can't even. Had you been a finals before that? What you mentioned? Oh, You'd aye, been aye, at aye. A couple... So I was at the Cup Final, Scottish Cup Final in 2000. I'd been at the Salt and Sauce Cup Final. Yeah. We got fucking pumped by hearts, which is one of the Five worst, one, worst it, days huh? of my life. But we all knew it was coming. Like, again, I was sitting with Kano. Fenland, wasn't it? Oh, I was sitting with Kano. Uh, and we, had, we must have had about 20 lads in that squad on loan. Yeah. And they were shite. <laughs> and I'm looking at big ga- like big uh, Gaz spoke big, about it on the big, 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 uh, Gaz was brilliant on it, <laughs> and I'm thinking, poor fucker, he's a hips fan, and these pricks are like here for the money, and yeah. it, it was embarrassing. I remember there was a tackle in like the first two minutes, Ian Black fucking ended somebody, and I thought this is going to be horrific. Oh, this is going to be horrific. It was awful. But the 2006 was amazing. John Collins. I remember the semi final to get to a final. We played Livingston was great because Kate's dad was manager at Livy. Right. And I went to loads of Livy. I went to loads of Livy with Kate back, and it was yeah. a great time of life actually. Yeah. But um, I what other cup finals did I go to? That's I, I've been. I've had a few shockers. Like I remember being with a guy who'd been to 23 Hibs Cup finals and seen two trophies by the time the Scottish Cup came around. Wow. That's mental. See that Hibs that hmm. tag? Did, would you go along I, with it? I definitely. Uh-huh. I, Just glorious feeling. Like uh-huh. There was a, there was a really real feeling in the ground at Easter Road in a game where you thought, oh, "Fuck, uh-huh. <laughs> someone's, coming, someone's, uh-huh. come, someone's coming here." Especially against Hearts. So see, when you were going to that game, 2016, you again expecting failure. Well, you got you got to remember we've been at the League Cup final, eh? Yeah. And Ross County beat us, didn't they? Oh, so they did, right? Uh-huh. So I'd been at that with Jimmy, and that was really depressing because I'd gone with no like expectations, but we, beat, yeah. but we should have beaten them. Yeah. We should have fucking beaten them. So we turned up thinking this could be bad, and. Uh, what was it? 1-0, 1-0, 2-1, 2-0, 3-2, wasn't it? And uh, I ended up on the pitch. Like, Were you on it? I mean, I've got a great video of me and Jimmy on the pitch, like running around, like my brother's in the dugout. And uh-huh. at one point I turned around and Jimmy went, Dad, why is, there, why is there horses on the pitch? And I thought, oh no, this isn't a... I thought it was a celebration. I didn't realise it was a riot. riot uh-huh. And uh, also, like when, when the final whistle went, I had Jimmy like up in the air with my brother. And we were in the aisle and we all just got bundled forward, which is pretty hairy, like, because yeah. everyone just went poof. And I was like, shit, maybe we should just go. And then we saw everyone run on the pitch for that. Fuck it, we'll go on. Yeah. But I actually feel a wee bit guilty about it now because the players didn't get a lap of honour. Yeah. And that isn't fair. I think And Kano had a go at me as well. And he was like, you shouldn't have gone on because the players have been deprived of a magical moment. 
But like, see that a, a guy came up to Jimmy on the way home with a bundle of turf and put it in his pocket. We plant, planted it in the garden. In the garden, there. garden oh, brilliant! So we've got a bit of that. And I, I don't, I, I wasn't editor of the Sun at the time. eh? fuck it. I don't care. It was like I love that. 114 years. Like I was so happy, and it was the first time I ever edited the English paper the next day, right? The first, the, the big paper. Right. So I had to get on a plane on the Sunday morning, fly down like stupid o'clock, and there was a Ranger fan sitting two seats across from me. And I gave him pellets. Did you tell your army? <laughs> and it was quite bad because I'd, I'd had a drink as well, and it, like they always say, you should never edit a newspaper drunk. Right. right. And I tell you what... Did you I, put it back in about Hibs? I, I, mate, I, I, imagine sitting at the office and Hibs have won the Scottish Cup. I couldn't get off my phone. Like Everybody was like, where are you? Where are you? We're on Easter Road. We're here, we're here, there. And I was sitting in an office oh, in London. You. It was a beautiful sunny day as well. And my brother's sending me videos of him. Like he, I don't, I've never seen my, I haven't seen my brother cry since he was 15 and I booted him in the balls. <laughs> he was blubbing, you know? And uh-huh. it was mad because like, all the folk around us are like, I wish my dad was here, my dad's dead, or my granddad would have loved this, or... It was mental, like, and sunshine on Leith. Like, oh, man, how good is sunshine on about, Leith? About two, three times. Did you get emotional? Oh, fuck I, yeah. You cried, eh? Huh? Yeah, like, me and my brother, you got to remember, like, we went to every game this season, we got relegated. I've travelled all around the country, the first division. We went to almost all those games. I've, you know, East Stirling getting beaten, fucking miserable in the pish and rain on a Wednesday night and stuff. Like, yeah. I've, I've been through the shite with Hibs. I've like, mm-hmm. really seen some shite. I never thought it would happen. Have you, have you done the Proclaimers? Oh, yeah. what do you mean? Have you interviewed the player? Oh, I, oh, I, yeah. And the pals? I, I, listen, I speak to them every time there's a hips thing on. I wrote an article for the Salt and Sauce Cup final. Right. Interviewed Dougie Scott, Irvin, Proclaimers, uh, all the famous hips fans I could think of, and uh, it was a disaster. So I vowed never to do any sports-related journalism to do with hips. Why was it a disaster? Because we got pumped. Oh, right, so yeah, you got beat every so time. So you've got uh, all these folks in, you'll never have a better chance to win the Scottish Cup against them. What a great way to do it. Okay. <laughs> Horrific. Beaten by one. Uh, David Murray. Gray scored the winner as well, captain. Mm. And fitting that his ears look like the Scottish Cup as well. <laughs> yeah. uh, but he's a hero, aren't he, David SDG, Gray? SDG, so David Gray. Uh-huh. Yeah. What I wanted to ask you was, remember, I took off camera. Best, better midfield. McGinn, McGeek, and Scott <laughs> Allen or Thompson, Brown, and Boozer. That is a brilliant question. Thanks, right? mate. Well, Cheers. Look, it's not even on the br- script, I just came up with it. It's a fucking brilliant question because McGinn, McGeek won the Scottish Cup. So right. it's him. It's got. It has to be. And to, by the way, Thompson Brown and Beslan were absolutely brilliant. Like, yeah. Bruni's gone on and done great. Kevin did well, but I'm sure he feels he could have done better. Yeah. But McGinn, I think he's got another move in him. So do you think McGinn's the best you've seen at Hibs midfield wise? <sighs> no, best midfielder Swaggy. I've seen at Hibs is Latapi. Right. When he played in centre midfield, like just behind the front two, you know, as an attacking midfielder, Sozy was amazing. But he played centre half quite a lot yeah, of the time. So he people did. forget. But God, what a what a collection of midfielders to choose from like John Collins I'm going to put Paul Kane in as well because he's a pal <laughs> uh, John Collins I, Kevin Thompson Scott Brown and there are a lot of good, I like Chris Jackson who's a boy that played for Hibs when I first started supporting him Ginger Lad he was good Chris Jackson uh, he was good uh, who else played Chick Charlie Ray Wilkins oh brilliant <laughs> so have you got one favourite Kevin Harper I loved when I was a wee boy Kevin Harper stays right next to me no way his wee boy goes to my wee boy's school he was magic was like, he yeah because yeah, I, tw- I was 12 at my first game and he was just this like Exciting player, he got the ball on the wing, and you always thought he was going to do something. Yeah, uh-huh. and there were loads of players that I loved. Like, yeah, like you say, Gordon Hunter. I love Bruni. Uh-huh. Uh, I, I, like, so much energy, Bruni. Did, did, energy did, did. Driving the ball. Yeah, I'm trying to think of other players off the beaten track. Like, like, I've got to say, Liam O'Sullivan, Ian Murray. That was, oh, I Ian thought, Murray's a good pal, isn't he? he? I liked Ian. I always think the Hibs fans gave him a hard time. I think he's one of the boys. If you played with, you'd respect how good he was. But to watch, you didn't look all, yeah. all that. But I like Ned. Uh, a lot of he's Edward, we played him last week. Uh, Edward, yeah. He's doing well, yeah, uh, Just a wee bit on Scotland, mate. It's a disaster just now, isn't it? I've got a terrible, a I've got a terrible record watching. My first Scotland game was against New Zealand at Tyne Castle, and I, I think we scraped a one-all draw. So that set the tone for my uh, life. 1998, sitting down in the pub down the road, we all said, right, can we afford to go to France 98? And all of us were like, we're skint. Fuck it, we'll go to the next one. Oh, we'll go, we'll go, oh, honestly, oh, that would have say, been yeah. the best one ever as well. Uh-huh. Eh? I mean, it will never. I don't think it could ever be. I don't know. I'd Can love you to ever go see us doing it? Yeah. At the moment, no. Like, I'd love to go with Jimmy. Eh? I, I, the, I would love to go with Compton, Jimmy, Josh Taylor, all, all, all us lot. Get Imagine, a proper laugh. Uh-huh. Like, make it like take three, two, two weeks off, <laughs> and then so watch some of the big games. <laughs> but I, I would love to follow Scotland somewhere exciting, and I've never had the chance to do it. Like I say, the best half was Ireland. Um, and then Scotland, oh, Brazil, that was Scotland, Ireland, Brazil, uh, Emirates. I don't even remember the game. 
No. It was, but then, it's a weird thing with Scotland. I don't think anybody would admit they're there for a football, are they? No, nah, it's for a drink, isn't it? Uh, 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 right. Obviously, you had the sun job, but as you've said, no all glamour. No. Nah, nah, you've talked I mean, about the good times, but also yeah. you've, you've had a lot of bad times, haven't you? So, like, I was really young when I was at the paper, right? So, you, it's impo- I think it's really important for me to try and explain to people. I started there young, and it was before social media, right? It was before the internet, really. I mean, I, I qualified as a journalist before mobile phones were being used, right? So, wow. give you an idea of the time. So I didn't realise the hatred that the paper had. I knew there was a problem, but I didn't realise quite how bad it was. And then when social media kicked off, you start to, you're more accountable than ever, right? So mm. people can tell you they don't like you and you hear it. And it's like, as much as I like think I've got a thick skin, I did not like, I get upset by stuff, yeah. particularly because I think I'm an all right person, eh? So when somebody's calling you a horrible, life ruining tabloid cunt, it gets to me because I'm not that guy, right? Yeah. I'm not that guy. And don't get me wrong, the stuff that the paper's written and I've been involved in that probably hurt people, right? I feel bad about that. And I, I, there's definitely part of me that will spend a long time apologising to folk for things. But, you know, on the whole, I wrote a load of positive stuff. We made loads of money for charity. We did loads of really good stuff. And, you know, for every bad story, you know, we, we made, the, the paper made more money than France for the Help in Haiti appeal, right? That gives you yeah, an idea right. of the power of the readership, yeah. right? And, um, like, we did loads of great stuff. And I don't know, I think people forget. I didn't sit there and go, right, let's ruin somebody's life today. Like, when I did Bazaar, I was like, right, let's have some, let's have a crack. Let's have a laugh, let's isn't have it? a bit of mischief. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it was never, mali- I didn't feel like I was malicious. Like, there's a couple of times I did get people bloody noses. But, um, like, on the whole, I'm really proud of it, actually, in a way, because I have seen things I would never have seen otherwise. Yeah. It gave me, and I have to be grateful to the, to the Sun for giving me that chance, right? It was the biggest paper. We wouldn't have got the greatest we, open go interview of all time either. Wait, wait, there's, for we, the we, we haven't even scratched the surface, right? Mm-hmm. And it's like uh, uh, the sun in Scotland was a mad period of my life because, again, I had two young children, very young children, and it, it was stressful and it was a big change. It wasn't a laugh anymore. You're then the boss, you're accountable. Like, if I make mistakes and it costs the paper money, someone's losing their job, mm-hmm. or I'm going to jail, or I'm going to get filled in in the street, or somebody's going to get stabbed, right? That isn't funny. And I, I took it so seriously. I made myself a bit ill with it because I was worried, you know. And look, you know, everybody, you can't go home with everybody, right? Um, and on the whole, I think I, I conducted myself the best I could. The Levson inquiry, the criminal inquiries, all that stuff was a, like a real wake-up call for me. And uh, it, it, it made me grow up fast, I'll tell yeah. you that, Sally. I, I became an adult, I became a grown-up. So I did two and a half, three years at the Scottish Sun. And that was the Commonwealth Games, the Ryder Cup, amazing to be brilliant. Involved. Brilliant, and I'll, I'll, there's a lot of folk there I have a lot of affection for, right? And like the sports boys, like they, they got me through. I love them, like uh, Roger. Is Hanna. that who you would hang out with the oh, most? I love sports them. boys. Uh, yeah. uh, is it like a dressing room sort uh, of thing? Yeah, I mean, they probably think I'm a total fanny, but I like them. <laughs> and I'm, like Tam Cowan, like gave him a job, and like yeah. I worked with a guy Martin Geisler, gave him a career, and and as a columnist, and I hopefully helped the young guys come through. I'm dead proud of that, and like encourage them, maybe open some doors in London for folk. And I, I hope some of the guys I work with realise that because. I'd been in London I could fight their corner really well so I kept jobs and I think if it hadn't been you know if maybe been a Scottish editor they might not have been able to to preserve the jobs as well as I did by leveraging my contacts down there you know yeah. fighting for them but also I saw the helicopter crash eh? the bin lorry tragedy that cliff, isn't it, isn't it? I, so I've, I've got a bit of baggage carrying with me since then and um I don't know like people didn't see that side of the things that you carry with you nah, eh? just uh... and like you know like I, I don't take it any pleasure at all in upsetting somebody over a story, right? No pleasure whatsoever. So if I've genuinely hurt somebody, like you, you want to think you can square that off, don't you? Yeah. And um, yeah, it's maybe going to take me a wee while to come to terms with it. But it's been three and a half years, eh? See, while you were in it, were you always thinking on the side? Aye. I aye, want to do my own thing. Aye, And what definitely. was that? I, wanted to, I always wanted to write books. I wrote Vinnie Jones' book. I'm his did biographer, you? yeah. So I did that. What's well, he like, top on? World class, uh-huh. yeah. I mean, me and Vinnie have been through the wars like How amazing. did that come about with Vinnie Jones? It's, it's mental, right? Uh, 2011. I was on the red carpet at an event and um, somebody said to him, that's Gordon, he works for The Sun. And somebody had written a bad review and called him, called, or somebody had written a picture caption and called him fat. <laughs> and he's come across, right, and he's grabbed me by the throat and he's like fucking ran me against this railing and going, your fucking newspaper called me fat, sweaty. And, I was like, <laughs> and I've, I've got, got my hands underneath his, knocked them apart and his hands have fallen apart like that and I've pushed them and he's fallen back like that. And I said, I don't give a fuck what happened to the paper. Do not come and grab me by the throat, you prick. And he's like, all right, you're OK. And uh, we went for a so beer. So you've leathered Vinnie Jones, So I that. fucking pushed them back. <laughs> by the way, I was sh- shiting it beyond belief. I pushed them back and we went for a beer. And he was like, you're the first person that's ever done that from the press. Actually fought me back. And we sat down. And from that day on, 
like we played golf together we, and he phoned me up and said right I'm going to do a book do you write it for me and I was like yeah brilliant no problem so I went and lived with him in LA for three weeks and uh, sat down every day smoked cigars played golf recorded it all so and the Wimbledon stories and all, all of that I mean I'll give you an idea right? we wrote 140,000 words and the final book was 80,000 that's how much was taken out. <laughs> he, he, that sounds like Gary O'Connor's interview. Oh, was. mate, is it? Uh, aye, aye. It was the same sort of thing. Like he, t- he told me a story about going on tour with a crazy gang, and they got <laughs> the physio Frenchie was really tight. So they're like, get a fucking drink in French. He's like, no, lads, the Cubs playing for this. This isn't coming in my pocket. And they're like, fuck him. De- him and Dennis Wise. Can't even mind who else it was to go hold the Frenchie. And they had him by the ankles over the edge of the fucking North Sea Steve. Ferry and dropped him in <laughs> they, by accident. Was that Steve Allen, the physio? Uh, no, it was Fre- the guy Cur- Frenchie. Curly hair? No, it wasn't. No, him. no, I can see. But they, they've, dro- they've dro- accidentally dropped him. <laughs> And like, you, apparently he was like three minutes before you die, so they had to like fucking get him, get him out of the fucking seat. But like, the, I can't tell you the half of any stories because they're uh, so good. But I started speaking to him just last week, like love him dearly. Because he's lost his wife. Aye, man, so sad. Longest living heart transplant patient in the world ever. What a story! Eh? Wow, amazing. But uh, Ivan is a good pal, so I always thought I might write books. I always had like I have still have this notion of doing something like uh, Jonathan Sutherland's job. On, uh, sports, uh, yes, yeah. we'd love to do that. Uh, yeah. you'd be good at that but I've never done sports journalism because that's your passion. What, imagine the problem is it spoils your hobby, right? Yeah. Because I want to go to the football and I want to enjoy my weekends. But when it becomes work, it's like you, like you, you've killed your passion by making it work. work uh, no, I, I mean? love it, man. So like, I still, I love, think, you, I think, I, I'd think love you, to do it. That's when when it's football, I think it's yeah. different. Eh? Dave Jones and Sky. That, oh, that's he's tremendous. Job. He's I used tremendous. to play with him. He was on our team. What Sutton? Ah, yeah. No, no, that was a Southern Amateur League. That was a team called Ibis. I played for them. And, uh, Could be some big names, Dave Jones, Dave Jones was in the team, and after one of the games, he took me aside at the bar and he went, "Gordon, um, I've got a bit of a problem. If we're going to play centre midfield together, you swear too much." <laughs> Did he really? <laughs> Why not, Dave? I, know, I, know, I was like, Dave, I'm going to say one thing to you. Fuck off. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. Uh, and now, mate, your radio right. show. Um, enjoying it. That's the best. I'm having the time of my life. It's great. Good. You know, it's been three years. It's a bit weird working evening seven till ten. It's kept me out of the pub, which is brilliant. Which I've is got, terrible. Uh, which is <laughs> probably for the best. Uh-huh. But I've, again, interviewing all the bands I love. I'm playing music I love. I'm working with folk like Johnny Vaughan every day, who's great crack, Toby Tarrant. It's a really good crop of people. And um, I've got another year still to go, and uh, I love it. I really love it. I just, I've got to make the decision at some point if I'm going to have to go and work at Talk Sport or like Alan Brazil. Oh, would you like that? Oh, I'm, I will gradually turn into Alan Brazil. <laughs> when I was telling you about the stripper, he sent us a picture. Strip, she sends me a picture every three days of what Alan's looking like going <laughs> three years and counting. <laughs> Cogs in. I love her. She sounds She's good. good. You know yeah. her. I do. I don't talk about it now. Right, okay. But uh, I, um, no, they're great. I, I, I reckon at some point, sport, I. Will you move back up here eventually? Oh, mate, I'd, it's so tricky. I kind of get the answer to this, right? Three, three years now. Fly down on a Monday, back on a Friday. They're pissed off early tomorrow, Saturday. They call it the Poets Flight. Right. What's the other one? Willie's. Well, work in London, live in Edinburgh. Really? Willie's. <laughs> Aye, I need to, I need to fix that somehow. I just if the whiskey works out, maybe you can chuck it. Maybe. Uh-huh. I, I love it though. It's the same for you. Eh? I'm loving the dream, mate. I'm enjoying it. Uh-huh. I'm having the time of life. And you've got the feel, this feel on TV as well. Aye, this Tell feel us on. a bit about that. Where we can watch it. So YouTube, it's on. We do an episode every couple of months. Right. And we've got Crouchy on the next one. Reverend oh, the brilliant. Makers. I Crouchy's great on it as well. Reverend the Makers good on Twitter. I, I like him. Uh-huh. So the, Crouchy's singing his football songs on it, which is funny. Right. You know the one about uh, QPR. Oh, I've heard that we're yeah, no income feet tax. in the bed. And, uh, no, no, that's oh, Liverpool that's, one. Uh, one uh, Only Fools and Horses, horses are. But he's, yeah. he's great on it. And we've got a couple of bands on there. The Twang, who've been going for a few years. The Twang, I remember. Really yeah. good, I. Two um, kisses, so two, is it Two Lovers? Aye, some, uh, aye, that's right, so yeah. we, we love them. And uh, aye, we're just trying to give bands a big break. So we give Jerry Cinnamon his first gigs. I gave him his first play on the radio. Tremendous. Chuffed to see Jerry doing well, Dylan John Thomas, all of that. So it's about our passion for music. I mean, as we didn't do it for the money, put it that way, right? Me and my mate Mikey do it. We're Red Stripe, and it's um, it's been great. We've done ten episodes this time. We did six before. It's funny, Crouchy. The first time we used to do this thing, chuck a telly out the window. Right. It's the most rock and roll thing you can do, uh-huh. right? As a rock star. So we set it up with a target downstairs. You got to try and land it on the bullseye. And Crouchy, we never used to do the bullseye. We used to do the furthest throw. And then Crouchy nearly killed somebody with a telly. Like, he, he, honestly, we didn't think he could throw that far. He threw it about fucking thirty meters. Out. Long levers, eh? Whizzed it. But um. The funny thing was, though, he hit the window on the way out. He couldn't even fucking get, get it through the window. Off the post and in. <laughs> Put it your post in. You got time for one more story? Yeah, go for it, mate. I've, never, I've never, never told this story Brilliant. before. Can't right? wait for it. Because this was kind of like the peak bad behaviour time, right. right? 
And um, it was, you know, I was talking about that Jay-Z gig. Yeah. We got invited to the after party in a nightclub called Movida, right? And two days before, I interviewed the Pussycat Dolls, right? Which had gone really well, right? We'd had a bit of a, a laugh. How well? A, uh, very well. Right. <laughs> so um, we're in this nightclub having a drink and a laugh, and I'm speaking to the girls, having a chat. And uh, there's one girl on the band called Karma, I think she's like the redhead one. And Edgar Davids walks in, right? And he kind of, so he had the he had the fucking gex on. They got they got, they got the gex the on. Right? And this is when he had the fucking dreadlocks as well, right? So he comes up, and I'm standing, and the girls are like, "Oh hi, no idea who he is, fucking no idea." And he he just said, "Sorry, girls, you can fuck off now." And, they, <laughs> and I was like, and like they kind of uncomfortably laughed, and I was like, I was in a, again in a suit, and I was like, "What was that, Edgar?" And he went, "I said to you, you can fuck off now." <laughs> I was like. Edgar, Edgar, that's not the right way to start a conversation. Would you like me to introduce you to the girls with the Pussycat Dog? So I thought, fuck, I'll have a bit of laugh with this. So I've introduced them. Here's Nicole, this is Karma. I've done the introductions. And then um, he's like, so at one point, two of them go to the toilet and there's three of them left and they're talking amongst themselves. And he said, so what football team do you support then? And I'm like, I'm a Hibs fan. You heard of Hibs? And he's like, Scottish football, it's shit, man. <laughs> he said, who could's ever come from Scotland? And I'm like, look, you told me to fuck off. If you want to have an argument about Scottish football, do you want to start in management or do you want to start with footballers? Let's start with players. We had a Kenny Dalgleish. Better than you will ever be, you prick. <laughs> <laughs> and he's like, hey, don't call me a prick, man. And I'm like, no, fuck you. You've insulted Scotland and said to me Scottish football is shite. You said nothing good's coming out of Scottish football. Let me fucking talk to you about management, shall we? What about Shankly, Ferguson, Steen, the three greatest ever? He's like, who are those guys? <laughs> and I'm like, no way. I'm like, listen, Edgar, I'm going to tell you now, you need to fuck off because you've overstepped the mark. And he's like, put his glass down and he's fucking grabs me, right? But he's grabbed me by the arms. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm, 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 <laughs> he's grabbed me. And I'm like, I dropped my glass and the glass smashed. So everybody's turned around and I thought, oh, fuck. And I thought he was going to stick the head on me, right? And he's only little as well. So I've grabbed him by the arms and then thought, oh, fuck. He's, a, he's like a proper unit. He's like a pit bull. Uh-huh. Ripped. And I, I, could, I, could, I couldn't get my hand around his biceps like that. And I thought, oh, fuck. So I've pushed him as far away as I could. And he's like, fucking, I'm, he's trying to go for me with the head with the glasses on. And the dreadlocks are going. Becky can start and I, on you. I've got like fucking work shoes on, right? <laughs> He had trainers on or whatever. And the next thing I'm like, fuck, he's really going for it here. And everyone's watching by this point. So we're scuffling at the bar. So I've like put my foot behind them and like just tripped them up on the floor. So I'm lying on top of Edgar Davids and I'm like, just hug him, just hug him, just cuddle him, don't let him go. So I'm holding on to him, not throwing any punches, just thinking, he'll tie it out, he'll tie it out, he'll tie it out. And he's like ripping at me and all this. The bouncers come steaming over and I've got my like suit ripped open, my shirt ripped open. The, the bouncers have got me and he's on the other side. They're like all holding him back. He is going mental. And I'm like, yeah, fuck you. I never had mama classes anyway. Yeah, prick. <laughs> <laughs> Giving it the point, thinking, oh shit, don't let him go, don't let him go. So anyway, the horse are both out of the front this nightclub I get emptied out this is like three o'clock in the morning we get emptied out and he's still going for me and all the cameras are like taking pictures of fucking Edgar Davis like windmilling and I'm like yeah fuck off prick <laughs> and I'm got, got into the black cab and closed the door and pissed off <laughs> mate have ever a story summed up your life it's that <laughs> Edgar Davis but yeah anyway the best end of the story was um, we were out a wee while after that and I was quite pally with the League of Their Own Boys so I knocked about with James Corden right. and name dropping prick right? no it's brilliant I love it. so we were knocking about together at that time and Redknapp was out and I said to Jamie I was like fucking hell he was at Spurs at the time so he was uh, Edgar was at Spurs I was like, fucking Edgar Davis, by the way. And he's like, what's up? I went, oh, f- wow, God, I had a scrap on my head. <laughs> it was pretty hairy. Like, I, said, I don't know if I should be phoning Spurs about it because it was, it was bad. Like, he's an angry wee cunt. And he was like, don't worry about it. Anyway, apparently, like two weeks later, Robbie Keane had a straightener with him in the car park and him, didn't he? booted shit out of Edgar Davis for all the same reasons from being and he got pumped from Spurs didn't he uh-huh. but, I thought you were going to say he backed them because of what he done to you no no no, no. I'd, I'd love that to be <laughs> I the story I'd have made it better it? no Robbie Keane <laughs> we'll did just it. remind that I, Robbie, Robbie Keane <laughs> Robbie Keane did it for himself although I would love to think that Redders has had a word in his ears and to do him pile in but there you go mate I'm telling you my favourite interview yet it's been mean, an absolute pleasure we haven't scratched the surface son we'll do part two do right? I, I, I'm up for Gordon. that what a guy thanks very much do you know what I do a hip hop handshake <laughs> the worst one I saw was uh, I'll show you Mr Hudson in the library Ken him no. He did that Oh Mr Hudson And then, he, did, he, did, and then he, he did that And then he clicked his fingers at the top I felt sullied man Prick Fuck, Do that the next time you do an interview <laughs> Thanks you? very much mate I've loved it Anytime What a guy